の実現に取り組んでおります。昨年の東京オリンピック・パラリンピック大会では、伝統的なアイヌ舞踊を披露し、アイヌ文化を発信いたしました。この大会で全ての人がお互いの人権や尊厳を大切にし支え合う共生生活の実現を目指す姿を世界に示すことができたことを嬉しく思います女性の人権の保護も重要です本年日本は脆弱な立場に置かれた女性に対し対する新型コロナ対策のためニューウォーマン、UN ウォーマンなどに約620万ドル拠出をいたします。議長、韓国の代表が慰安婦問題に言及をいたしました。日本政府は慰安婦問題の最終的かつ不可逆な解決を確認した2015年の日韓合意を含め、長きにわたって慰安婦問題に真摯に対応をしてきております。また、日韓合意に基づく事業につきましては、多くの元慰安婦の方々から評価を得ております。以上から、韓国側の発言は受け入れられません。議長、日本は人間の安全保障、誰一人取り残さないとの理念のもと、引き続き国際社会と緊密に連携をし、人権の保護、促進に貢献をしてまいります。どうもご清聴ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。Now, eh, y ahora le doy la palabra a su excelencia, el señor Zbigniew New Rau, ministro de Relaciones Exteriores de Polonia. Tiene la palabra. Bienvenido. Mr. President, Madam High Commissioner, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's imperative that I begin with condemning in the strongest terms Russian military aggression that was launched on Ukraine last week. The unprecedented armed attack destroys the foundations of the existing security architecture and constitutes a flagrant violation of international law, including the UN Charter. The horror that was imposed on my country's neighbor has already caused deaths and suffering, including among civilians, and constitutes the most deplorable degree of violations of international human rights law. It also openly confirms our worst fears that Russia holds human rights in complete disregard. Over the past years, we have observed a serious deterioration of human rights situation inside Russia and an unprecedented increase of repressive policies aiming to silence dissenting voices. Any independent opposition activity is currently impossible in practice there. Poland warned about it repeatedly in this very forum. Now, Russian authorities' contempt for human life spilled over, although Ukrainian people have already suffered from Moscow's hand. We urge every member and observer state of the Human Rights Council to deplore Russia's human rights violations in this very council created to safeguard human rights. Poland welcomes the Council's decision to hold an urgent debate on the human rights situation in Ukraine 
stemming from the Russian aggression. I thank the many members who supported it. The Council should address violations of the rights ensuring documentation and accountability. We also need to ask ourselves, should Russia continue to be a member of the Human Rights Council? Poland continues to be alarmed by the constantly deteriorating human rights situation in the occupied Crimea, where the repressive policies of occupational Russian administration strongly targets Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians. We are also concerned by arbitrary detentions and torture already used in Eastern Ukraine. I want to express my solidarity with Ukraine and make it clear that Poland has taken actions in cooperation with our allies to stop this brutal, unprovoked and unjustified act of war. The support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity remains a cornerstone of Polish foreign policy. This support needs to be voiced clearly. We have already witnessed where Russia's aggressive policy of occupying its neighbors leads. We saw it in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, Chin Valley region, and later in Crimea. International community must not allow this to continue. We call on Russia to immediately stop this war, to withdraw troops, and to respect human rights and humanitarian needs of the people of Ukraine according to obligations stemming from international law. Ladies and gentlemen, since 2020, we have been observing an unprecedented human rights crisis in the neighboring country of Poland, Belarus, after the fraudulent presidential elections. The enduring environment of repressions that followed has particularly targeted independent journalists and media outlets, human rights defenders, dissidents and lawyers, and even members of the national minorities. Nowadays, in Belarus, there are over 1,000 political prisoners, and this number is constantly growing. Poland stands in solidarity with all of them, including leaders of the Union of Poles in Belarus, Angelika Boris and Andrzej Poczobut, and more than 30 imprisoned journalists. Moreover, the Belarusian authorities did not hold back from reaching to even more deplorable levels of breaching international human rights law. This was clearly shown by the massive instrumental use of migrants to exert an artificial pressure on the EU borders. Now, it materialized in Belarus' participation in the war by helping the aggressor. All of these blatant human rights violations have occurred in a persistent climate of impunity. In this context, we underline the, the pivotal importance of the UN mechanisms established in this very Council to gather and preserve information and evidence of the human rights violations in Belarus in the context of the 2020 elections. The mechanism's activity has to be continued in order to fulfill its mandate. Ladies and gentlemen, our fight for the rights of those in vulnerable situations seems to be never-ending. 
despite efforts of many. In 2022, continuing our engagement from past years and expressing solidarity, Poland will advocate for the rights of children, persons with disabilities, women, and elder persons. We will also continue our commitment to advocating freedom of religion or belief with special attention paid to those suffering violence and discrimination due to their belonging to religious or belief minorities. We believe this is our moral obligation when conflicts, climate change, and the pandemic disproportionately affected those groups. Last but not least, Poland will continue efforts to promote principles of good governance. We also acknowledge that this Council has recently undertaken to accelerate efforts aimed at protecting human rights in the context of climate change. Distinguished colleagues, we must protect human rights always and everywhere and oppose all forms of discrimination or violence. These days, we cannot remain indifferent to suffering of millions of innocent people in Ukraine. We do expect that the Council and the entire international community will live up to its responsibilities and respond in promptly and appropriately way. Poland stands with Ukraine and calls for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And now I give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Marise Payne, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Women of Australia. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, Secretary General, High Commissioner, Excellencies and distinguished delegates. Australia is a strong supporter of the multilateral system, the central tenet of which is the United Nations Charter. The Charter has been a pillar for global peace and security since it was ratified seven decades ago. A resilient and effective multilateral human rights system makes the world safer and more secure for all, with respect, promotion and protection of human rights at its core. Australia condemns in the strongest possible terms Russia's unprovoked and unacceptable attack on Ukraine and its people. Russia has seriously breached international law and the UN Charter. We share the High Commissioner's concerns about the heightened risk of serious violations and abuses of human rights due to the deteriorating situation in Ukraine. We call on Russia to cease violence and hostilities. Australia is deeply concerned by the humanitarian cost that will be borne by the Ukrainian people as a result of this conflict. We are preparing assistance to support humanitarian relief through the UN and international agencies. Australia recognises the essential role that the Human Rights Council plays. We reiterate our firm and enduring support as an observer state and our commitment to being a constructive and open partner in human rights. A council that is fit for purpose, well-resourced, effective, transparent and accountable to member states is critical. Australia supports the Office of the Human Rights Commissioner and the independence of this office. The success of the Council depends not only on its institutional strength and resilience, but also, crucially, on the responsibility of its members to uphold the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights. Australia encourages cooperation and engagement from all states at the Council. But we must also acknowledge that the conduct of some states continues to fall short of the standards we expect. In this respect, Australia welcomes new Council members and their pledges to engage in the Council in good faith. 
We welcomed the High Commissioner's undertaking in the Council's 48th session to publicly release her Office's assessment on the allegations of egregious human rights violations in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Publication of this material as soon as possible is vital, given the absence of transparency from China surrounding these extremely serious abuses. We will continue to advocate for the protection, promotion and respect for human rights across our bilateral, regional and multilateral engagements, and particularly in our Indo-Pacific region. Australia continues to be particularly concerned by the deteriorating human rights situations in the DPRK, in Afghanistan and in Ethiopia. We are deeply troubled by the situation in Myanmar, where one year since the military coup, the Myanmar people's most basic human rights have been brutally suppressed. We continue to work with ASEAN partners and others in the international community towards a peaceful, democratic transition in Myanmar. Diversity of membership in the Human Rights Council is also vital if we're to understand the full range of human rights challenges before us and to respond effectively to them. Australia is focused on ensuring that the Indo-Pacific region is represented in both the issues considered by the Council and in its decision making. We thank Fiji, the first ever Pacific Island Council member, for their contributions to the Council over the last three years, including Ambassador Khan's tenure as President. We look forward to continuing to work with the Marshall Islands as an important voice for the Pacific this year and wish Timor-Leste every success for their aspirations to become a council member in the future. Australia continues to be committed to enhancing a Pacific voice on human rights and social inclusion. In facilitating the Pacific Satellite Summit of the Global Disability Summit, this month Australia has sought not just to elevate Pacific voices, but ensure that the social inclusion and human rights of people with a disability is a priority in our region. Social inclusion is a priority of Australia's human rights engagement. We will promote and advance the rights of Indigenous peoples globally and in our own country. We will champion equal rights and an end to violence and discrimination against LGBTI persons. We will continue our strong advocacy for the rights of women and girls, especially for full enjoyment of sexual and reproductive health and rights and an end to gender-based violence and discrimination. We will continue to oppose the death penalty in all circumstances for all people. It is deeply flawed and unfair. It is used disproportionately against the poor, people with intellectual disabilities and minority groups. Australia is committed to responding to violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Australia will use its expanded autonomous sanctions laws to take timely action and deter those responsible for gross violations of international human rights. Our recent reforms enable Australia to sanction people and entities responsible for or complicit in egregious conduct, including grave human rights abuses and malicious cyber activity. These measures are appropriate, effective and legitimate, fully compliant with international law. The lasting global impact of the COVID-19 pandemic will make adherence to human rights critical to future peace and stability. In pursuing global recovery, Australia reaffirms its commitment to sustainable development that places human rights at the centre of achieving sustainable and inclusive development. Australia reaffirms our strong call on all member states to protect, respect and promote human rights, particularly in times of crisis. Thank you. Y ahora tiene la palabra a su excelencia, señor Anwar Gargash, asesor diplomático del presidente de la, los Emiratos Árabes Unidos. Tiene la palabra. President, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the United Arab Emirates, I would like to extend our congratulations on your assumption of the presidency of the Human Rights Council. We're truly thankful for the trust placed in the UAE by the UN General Assembly last October when I was elected to become a member of the Human Rights Council for the third time for the 22-24 term. 
In this new term, the UAE will continue to focus on building bridges through dialogue, collaborating with partners, and supporting the work of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and her office. Mr. President, in a few weeks, the Dubai Expo 2020 will come to an end. I'm sure that everyone who participated in it will agree that it has been a celebration of all that is best and most aspirational about human society. The Expo may be ending, but we plan to ensure that it is the spirit that lives on, including through our work on this council. At the same time, we have been continuing to reinforce human rights at home in the UAE. In this spirit, I am delighted to be able to inform delegates that in line with the commitments we made in our most recent UPR, the UAE's National Human Rights Institution has now been established and began its operations in December. The NHRI is an independent entity in accordance with the Paris Principles, and we look forward to seeing it contribute to the protection and promotion of human rights in the UAE. It will soon be seeking accreditation in the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions. At the same time, we have been undertaking a wide-ranging review of our laws to make them increasingly progressive and fo more fully in line with our human rights responsibilities. This has led to substantial progress on a number of human rights files. But we know there is more to do, which is why we look forward to adopting a national action plan for human rights later this year, and will continue to examine ways to make even more progress. Mr. President, I will focus my brief remarks today on highlighting some of the challenges that I believe could benefit most from our collective efforts. There are few challenges more in need of a coordinated global policy response or that more starkly illustrate how much more needs to be done to promote human rights than the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, over the course of the pandemic, the UAE has been honored to closely collaborate with other countries to provide protective equipment to healthcare professionals and to support global vaccination efforts. Abu Dhabi's HOPE Consortium has, in its first year of operations, facilitated the delivery of over 250 million vaccine doses to countries around the world. It is therefore imperative we expand our collaborative efforts to combat COVID-19 and to ensure assistance reaches those who need it most. We believe that the commitment to human rights impossible to realize unless we empower level women at all levels of society and every sector. The UAE is proud of the continued indicators of our own progress on women's rights. These are well documented, but let me just mention two recent examples. The UAE is the highest ranked country in the Arab region in the World Economics Forum 2021 Global Gender Gap Index. And as a sign of Emirati women's pioneering work in STEM subjects, women constitute 80% of the scientific team that launched the Emirates Mars mission. The issue of climate change is one that matters deeply to our young people and one that poses a very real threat. Indeed, our youth will be the ones who are mostly impacted by it. So we have a collective responsibility to take action to mitigate the risks it poses to their future and their rights. That is why the UAE recently committed to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And it is why we will continue to support the work of the human rights mandates on climate change that were recently adopted by the Council. At the end of last year, the UAE was honored to be chosen to host COP28 Climate Summit which is set for November 2023. This speaks to our dedication to being a leader on global efforts to combat climate change. Mr. President, to make progress on these and other human rights related issues, it is vital that countries also strive to promote peace and security. Unless we do so, it will make the task of protecting and promoting human rights significantly more challenging. Regrettably, the new year has seen an escalation of tensions in our region. In the last month alone, there have been multiple ballistic missile and drone terrorist attacks launched by the Houthis and other non-state actors. These took the lives of three innocent civilians in the UAE. We're grateful for the condemnation of these terrorist attacks by the Security Council and the support expressed by more than 120 countries 
we now urge the international community to take decisive and tangible steps to pressure the Houthis to end this aggressive behavior and to engage in serious efforts to implement a ceasefire and reach a political solution in Yemen. Beyond the clear violation of international law that these terrorist attacks represent, we also see them as an attempt to undermine our efforts to promote peace and security throughout the region. Despite this, the UAE remains steadfast in our dedication to build the Middle East with prosperity, peace, and human rights for all. That is why the UAE has been working hard to build bridges through both bilateral and multilateral channels. We're taking determined steps to strengthen diplomatic relations with other countries in our region, especially those with whom we have had some disagreements in recent years. For example, our decision to sign the Abrahamic Accords was driven by a desire to reduce tension and build a shared platform for promoting better lives for people across the region. This is part of our wider efforts to promote a tolerance agenda in the region. We need countries to come together to counter hateful ideologies that threaten <coughs> peace between communities and that violate the human rights of others. Distinguished delegates, it is in that spirit that we look forward to collaborating with you to advance human rights for the benefit of all people everywhere. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Shukram. Uh, and now I give the floor to Her Excellency, Ms. Eva Maria Limetz, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Estonia. You have the floor, madam. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this spring's Human Rights Council is being overshadowed by a large-scale war started by Russia in the center of Europe in Ukraine. This has led to a widespread humanitarian catastrophe already in five days. I was in Kyiv when the bombing started. I saw and felt the tragedy of despaired people on my road out of the country. I was then returning home. They were leaving theirs. International community must stand up and act so that they have their homes back. Now, in 2022, we are all witnessing a major aggression against them, against the core principles of international law and against peace. Russia alone is responsible for what has happened and must be held fully accountable for its unprovoked, aggressive and illegal actions against Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and a crime against the people of Ukraine. Let me be clear, we are witnessing an aggression like which Europe has not seen since the end of the Second World War. Soon there are millions of victims of war. Russia must grant humanitarian access to people in need of food and medicines. We must act immediately to impose massive and severe costs on Russia. The international community must send a strong and united political message explicitly condemning Russia's illegal actions against peaceful Ukrainian population, actions that look like a precursor of the genocide. We have to stand with Ukraine and the people of Ukraine. We must lend Ukraine as much political and practical support as possible. We must be vocal in demanding the protection of human rights and international humanitarian law by the Russian Federation. Therefore, we welcome the decision to hold an urgent debate on Ukraine and call for the adoption of a strongest possible resolution. Russia, the aggressor that launched a war against another sovereign state and is causing the death and suffering of innocent people, is today a member of the Human Rights Council. Let me recall that the members of the Council are obliged to uphold the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights. The only way to retain the credibility of the Human Rights Council is to suspend the membership of Russia of the Council. Mr. President, the fact that Russia has chosen the path of aggression and has rejected diplomacy is not surprising in retrospect. This issue and the potential threats have been repeatedly discussed in the meetings and sessions at the Human Rights Council. Preparations by Russia for the launch of a large-scale invasion against Ukraine have been going on for many months now. 
Indeed, as allies and partners from the democ democracies made significant diplomatic efforts to avert conflict, Russia continued to amass troops on Ukraine's border. The link between the human rights situation and security is direct. The more authoritarian a state is, the more aggressive it is. Serious human rights violations often indicate potential armed conflict and thereby function as a warning mechanism. Over the last two decades, we have seen a steady decline in human rights in Russia and Belarus. Democratic institutions and associations are being repressed. Civil liberties and human rights are suppressed. These are the very bitter fruits we have today. Mr. President, at the current 49th session of the Human Rights Council, we will discuss a resolution on human rights defenders and will consider the reports of the Special Rapporteur. The importance of the role of individuals and civil society institutions that promote and protect human rights and fundamental freedoms cannot be overestimated. Their actions are very much needed and deserve sincere gratitude. It is our duty to support and protect these people and institutions. Growing authoritarianism in many countries has led to a situation where civil society institutions are being instrumentalized. Human rights defenders discover that they have been branded as foreign agents, have suddenly become dissidents in their own country and face real imprisonment. They also face regular threats, attacks, reprisals and acts of intimidation by the authorities. Women human rights defenders who are often working in life-threatening circumstances are particularly exposed to sexual and gender-based violence. There is mounting evidence that systematic and state-led strategies are used to silence human rights defenders. All these incidents of violence need to be documented and we demand that those responsible are brought to justice. The international community must do everything to prevent such acts of violence. Mr. President, I also want to express my concern for the Human Rights Group Memorial International, whose first honorary chairman was Nobel Peace Prize winner Andrei Zakharov, and which has recently been closed by Russia's Supreme Court. Please allow me to pay tribute to all journalists who, like human rights defenders, stand for human rights and human dignity and often sacrifice their lives to tell the truth. A few weeks ago, the Global Conference for Media Freedom was held in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia. The motto used by the conference came from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The freedom to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media is crucial to enabling the exercise of all other human rights. Next year, we will celebrate the 75th anniversary of this key UN document, and it is as relevant as ever. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency. Y ahora tiene la palabra Su Excelencia, el señor Roberto Álvarez, Ministro de Relaciones Exteriores de la República Dominicana. Tiene la palabra, Excelencia. Señor Antonio Guterres, Secretario General de las Naciones Unidas. Señora Michelle Bachelet, Alta Comisionada de Naciones Unidas para los Derechos Humanos. Señor Federico Villegas, Presidente del Consejo de Derechos Humanos. Señor Ignacio Casís, Presidente de la Confederación Suiza. Distinguidos jefes y jefas de Estado y de Gobierno. Distinguidas ministras y ministros, señoras y señores. Tras 16 años de la creación del Consejo de Derechos Humanos, hoy, frente a una crisis mundial considerada la peor catástrofe en un siglo, aún nos queda mucho camino por recorrer y grandes retos por superar. Esta pandemia ha exacerbado aún más las ya difíciles situaciones de las poblaciones más vulnerables y el surgimiento de nuevos desafíos que reclaman nuestro esfuerzo mancomunado. A pesar de ello, vemos con optimismo 
las palabras expresadas por el presidente de la Asamblea General de que este es el año de la recuperación. Para ello, es preciso adoptar medidas que contribuyan al desarrollo, a la paz y a la seguridad en todas las naciones, lo cual solo se podrá lograr desde un multilateralismo renovado. El gobierno dominicano, en aras de no dejar a nadie atrás, ha impulsado un plan de vacunación gratuito que ha sido exitoso, con resultados a la vista y cifras elocuentes. El 67% de la población elegible está completamente vacunada, cifra que ha ido en aumento en estos primeros meses del 2022. Aproximadamente el 79% de la población tiene al menos una dosis y más de un 27,5% tiene una tercera dosis, con una letalidad actual de 0,4%, siendo esta una de las menores del mundo. En ese sentido, creemos firmemente en la necesidad de que todos tengamos acceso de manera equitativa a las vacunas. República Dominicana ha donado en solidaridad unas 820 mil dosis a varios países de nuestra región. Llegado a este punto, me permito citar las palabras de nuestro presidente Luis Abinader de que solo estaremos seguros cuando todos estemos vacunados. En este trimestre, damos inicio al 49º periodo de sesiones del Consejo de Derechos Humanos y con ello República Dominicana reitera su compromiso con la democracia y los derechos humanos. Nuestro país ha ratificado los principales convenios de derechos humanos y les ha otorgado rango constitucional. En el 2004, dos años después de la creación de este Consejo, creamos la Comisión Interinstitucional de Derechos Humanos en nuestro país, un mecanismo que integra a todas las instituciones de los tres poderes del Estado en aras de cumplir con mayor eficacia con nuestros compromisos internacionales. La progresividad del derecho internacional de los derechos humanos nos ha permitido adoptar normas planes y programas para mejorar la calidad de vida de todas las personas en nuestro territorio. Un ejemplo a citar es el Plan Nacional de Derechos Humanos que describe la política pública transversal en esta materia en todo el sistema gubernamental y que aborda derechos civiles y políticos, derechos económicos, sociales y culturales. Protege las poblaciones más vulnerables y los migrantes alerta contra la discriminación, la trata de personas, entre otras materias. Para seguir ampliando los compromisos, tenemos gran interés en trabajar más de cerca con la comunidad internacional. Por eso hoy, en este escenario, República Dominicana anuncia su candidatura al Consejo de Derechos Humanos, dispuestos a mantener y promover las más altas exigencias en materia de la promoción y protección de todos los derechos. Cooperar con los trabajos del Consejo y continuar contribuyendo con los diferentes mecanismos existentes en esta materia que permiten su evaluación e implementación. República Dominicana presenta su candidatura para el periodo 2024-2026 al Consejo de Derechos Humanos convencidos de que, como país caribeño, jugaremos un rol importante mostrando con nuestro ejemplo el valor y la importancia de nuestra región en la defensa de los valores proclamados en la Declaración Universal de Derechos Humanos, para lo cual esperamos contar con el apoyo de todos ustedes. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Excelencia. Tiene la palabra ahora su excelencia, el señor Dorde Radulovich, ministro de Relaciones Exteriores de Montenegro. Tiene la palabra. High Commissioner, Mr. President, Excellencies, 
Ladies and gentlememen, distinguished delegates, we are holding the first HRC session this year against the backdrop of one of the most severe security and humanitarian crises in Europe's recent history. Montenegro remains deeply concerned about the situation on the ground and the growing number of human casualties. We strongly condemn military action of Russia at the territory of Ukraine that poses flagrant violation of international law and the core principles enshrined in the UN Charter and Helsinki Final Act, and we call for immediate ceasefire and reversal of its actions. Excellencies, in the dark days there must be a ray of light that will get us back on track, and that is why we must remain committed to multilateralism and the international forums we have created together, including this one where we speak today and remind ourselves of the values and principles to respect. It is my honor to address the HRC today on behalf of the government of Montenegro as its newly elected member state and to be in position to discuss contemporary challenges and trajectories of enjoying and respecting human rights and fundamental freedoms, human dignity and advancing the overall human rights agenda. Foremost, I would like to congratulate Mr. Federico Villegas on his, on his election as a president of the Human Rights Council for 2022. We highly appreciate the presented priorities, including further improving the efficiency of the Council and, in particular, its preventive role. Montenegro remains a credible, determined and forward-looking member of the Council in its efforts to meet its ambitious human rights agenda. We rec recognize and commend the work of the Council in the promotion and protection of human rights at the national, regional and global levels. The Council preventive role continues to be pivotal given the wide range of challenges for the full enjoyment of human rights across the globe, which came to the fore during the pandemic that most gravely impacted the vulnerable groups. Along those lines, we strongly advocate the active and sustainable promotion of human rights, the rule of law and democracy in building more inclusive, just, solidarity and resilient societies that promote and ensure the full protection of civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights. In that vein, we are utterly committed to sustainably contributing to the HRC mandate and to promoting an open, inclusive and constructive dialogue between Member States. Mr. President, Montenegro is strongly committed to protecting and promoting the universality, indivisibility and interdependence of human rights at all levels as a precondition for sustainable peace and security. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing inequalities and deepened the discrimination and the poverty gap. It is therefore our shared responsibility to ensure an inclusive, sustainable and more equitable recovery from the global crisis, including the human rights crisis. This also means making vaccines against COVID-19 public good and ensuring equal access to and distribution of all vaccines to all. We strongly condemn massive, systemic and widespread human rights violations, including attacks on civilians, journalists and human rights defenders, documented cases of enforced disappearance, forced detention, torture and other cruel punishments. Being strongly committed to advancing the human rights agenda, Montenegro will continue to also support the work of the High Commissioner and her office, projects and initiatives to strengthen human rights and freedoms globally. We remain concerned about the humanitarian tragedy and the growing number of persons in need in many conflict-affected countries. We recognize the importance of ensuring accountability for atrocity crimes and preventing their recurrence, emphasizing the important role of the International Criminal Court in this regard. Excellencies, as a member state of the Council, Montenegro will continue its constructive engagement in the work of HRC, addressing the most pertinent issues on the agenda. We will also promote our priorities in the Council, such as fundamental rights, freedom and freedoms, universal abolition of the death penalty, the rights of vulnerable groups, the impact of the pandemic on the human rights, the fight against discrimination on any ground. We will place a strong focus on children left behind, both within and beyond the pandemic context, promoting efforts and resolutions toward gender equality and actively participating at the same time in the sessions dedicated to access to education for most vulnerable groups, including minorities, Roma and refugees. We will also continue to participate in the work of core groups and uh, groups of, of friends having Montenegro as a member. We unequivocally support the right of all citizens to express their view and to make demands for positive change. We also support the commitment to strengthen cooperation with the civil society 
and create an environment conducive for unhindered participation of civil society in the work of the Council. Montenegro will also participate in efforts to strengthen the effectiveness of the UN treaty bodies and other human rights mechanisms. The cooperation within UPR and the active participation in all UPR sessions remain one of our priorities. Special procedures are an essential component of the UN human rights system and we encourage all countries to issue this standing invitation and accept their visits given the expertise the mandate holders can provide. Mr. President, at the national level, Montenegro is continuously striving to implement the necessary reforms aiming to build a stronger, sustainable and resilient system. We also see our membership in the HRC as an opportunity to further advance the national human rights agenda, including the system to protect the human rights of the most vulnerable. Montenegro's priorities in HRC are in line with our ongoing EU integration. We firmly believe that the synergy of these two processes will further enhance respect for the rule of law, human rights and fundamental freedoms in Montenegrin society toward further building a more resilient, more inclusive and more open society. Finally, I would like to reassure you that you can count on Montenegro as a constructive and dedicated partner in our joint efforts to strengthen uh, respect for human rights across the, the world and to enable a dignified life and full enjoyment of human rights and freedoms for all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency. Y ahora tiene la palabra Su Excelencia el Señor Ahmad Arman, Ministro de Asuntos Legales y Derechos Humanos de Yemen. Tiene la palabra. سعادة السيد رئيس مجلس حقوق الإنسان الموقر أصحاب المعالي والسعادة المشاركون جميعا إنه لشرف كبير لي أن أتحدث إليكم في هذا المحفل الدولي الهام لما تمثله حقوق الإنسان من مبادئ وأهداف نبية لمجتمعاتنا البشرية التواقة للعيش بكرامة وحرية وأمن وسلامة وتنمية وللأسف تنعقد هذه الفعالية الرفيعة المستوى وبلد اليمن يدخل عامه الثامن الحرب والمعاناة بسبب ما أقدمت عليه ميليشيات الحوثي في سبتمبر 2014 لقد كان الشعب اليمني طموحا في التغيير نحو الديمقراطية وبناء الدولة اليمنية الحديثة التي تعزز حرية الإنسان وتوفر الفرص المتساوية للجميع للمشاركة في العملية السياسية والاقتصادية والثقافية والاجتماعية وعقد لهذا الغرض مؤتمر الحوار الوطني الشامل برعاية الأمم المتحدة الذي توصل إلى نتائج هامة جدا على كل الأصعدة التي تلامس طلعات الشعب والتي انبثق منها مسودة الدستور الجديد مسودة الدستور الجديد لبناء الدولة اليمنية الحديثة بشكلها الاتحادي، وكان اليمنيون يتطلعون إلى إجراء استفتاء عام على مسودة الدستور للبدء في تنفيذ مخرجات الحوار الوطني وبناء مؤسسات الدولة الجديدة، واعتبروا هذه العملية الوسيلة الوطنية الشاملة لرسم خارطة الطريق لمستقبل اليمن والخروج بالمعالجات والحلول لكافة القضايا الوطنية. السيد الرئيس أصحاب المعالي والسعادة المشاركون جميعا. لقد تحدثت الحكومة اليمنية في محافل متعددة ومنها هذا المجلس الموق... منها هذا المجلس أوضحت بأن اليمن دخلت في النصف العام في النصف الثاني من العام 2014 في منعطف خطير للغاية حيث برزت جماعة الحوثي المسلحة التي رفضت ما اتفق عليه اليمنيون في مؤتمر الحوار الوطني الذي شاركت هي فيه ورفضت مسودة الدستور الجديد وارتكبت أعمال عسكرية أوقفت عملية الانتقال السياسي في اليمن وأدت إلى الانقلاب على السلطة الشرعية في 21 سبتمبر 2014 وكان الأحرى بالعالم أن يتخذ موقفا صلبا ضد الانقلاب في حينه ودعم الحكومة اليمنية لإنهائه كونه يعتبر انتهاكا صارخا لحقوق الإنسان وفرضا لإرادة مجموعة مسلحة بقوة السلاح وهو ما يتنافى مع القوانين والأعراف المحلية والدولية والمؤسف حقا هو ما يلاحظ من تعامل ناعم من قبل وكالات الأمم المتحدة ومفوضية حقوق الإنسان مع هذه الميليشيات والتي جعلها تزداد شراسة وعدوانية في قمع واضطهاد الشعب اليمني الواقع تحت سيطرتها وهناك العديد من التقارير التي تفضح ذلك السلوك الإجرامي ولا نزال نتطلع أن تعيد هذه الوكالات والمنظمات النظر في مواقفها المتراخية ويتخذ مواقف حازمة تسهم في ردع تصرفات تلك الميليشيات 
كما نطالب المجتمع الدولي ومجلس حقوق الإنسان أن يتخذ إجراءات فعالة من شأنها حماية المدنيين في المدن اليمنية المختلفة ومخيمات النزوح من الاعتداءات والهجمات الإرهابية التي ترتكبها ميليشيات الحوثيين بحق المدنيين والأعيان المدنية في اليمن وفي دول الجوار والتي تشكل انتهاكا صارخا للقانون الدولي الإنساني والقانون الدولي لحقوق الإنسان وتهديدا حقيقيا على المنشآت المدنية والحيوية وإمدادات الطاقة واستقرار الاقتصاد العالمي وتقويض الأمن والسلم الإقليمي والدولي ومن بين هذه الجرائم التي ارتكبها ميليشيات الحوثيين هو اتخاذ السكان كرهائن في مدن وقرى كامله واستخدامهم كدروع بشريه واستخدام المدارس والمراكز المدنيه كمخازن للاسلحه والمباني الحكوميه كمراكز للاعتقال واسطح المنازل للقنص واستهداف المدنيين وتمارس الخطف والاغتصاب وتلفيق الاتهامات واحتجاز الناشطات سياسيا ومهنيا كما ان هذه الميليشيات تواصل حصار المدن وتحرم السكن من السكان من حريات من حريه التنقل او الوصول للماء والغذاء وتستخدم التجويع كوسيلة حرب ونظرا لما ترتكب هذه الميليشيات الإرهابية فإن نطالب المجتمع الدولي ومجلس حقوق الإنسان التحلي بالمسؤولية تجاه إرهاب الحوثيين والمتعارض ضد المدنيين في اليمن وخارجه وضد الملاحية الدولية في البحر الأحمر والعمل على سرعة تصنيفهم كجماعة إرهابية حتى يتمكن العالم من فرض المزيد من العقوبات تجاه قادتهم المتورطين بارتكاب تلك الجرائم السيد الرئيس أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الحاضرون جميعا إن الوضع المأساوي الناتج عن الانقلاب أوجد معاناة إنسانية حقيقية في اليمن وخاصة في تلك المناطق الواقعة حسنة الميليشيات الحوثية بسبب تصرفات تصرفاتها اللا إنسانية المتجسدة في نهب أموال الدولة من عوائد الجمارك والضرائب والمؤسسات الإرادية الأخرى ووصلت حد, حد تلك المراسات حد سرقة المساعدات الإنسانية كما اعترفت بها بعض الوكالات الدولية وأجدها فرصة لأعبر عن تقدير وامتنان الحكومة اليمنية لكل الدول والمنظمات التي قدمت الدعم والمساندة للشعب اليمني ولا تزال وأهمها مركز الملك سلمان للمساعدات الإغاثية والإنسانية والهلال الأحمر الإماراتي وغيرها من الدول والمنظمات واختاما إن مستقبل اليمن الآمن والمزدهر لن يتحقق إلا بإنهاء الانقلاب ووضع سياسة سليمة لسلام دائم وشامل وحقق النماء والعيش المشترك لكل اليمنيين وفقا للمرجعيات الثلاثة المتفق عليها محليا وإقليميا ودوليا وهي مخرجات الحوار الوطني الشامل والمبادرة الخليجية وآليتها التنفيذية وقرارات مجلس الأمن الدولي وخاصة القرار 22/16 سلاما يحافظ على قيم الديمقراطية والشرعية ومقومات بناء الدولة والنظام والقانون التي ينشدها كل اليمنيين ومن هذه المكان يناشد المجتمع الدولي أن يدعمنا في تحقيق ذلك في أقرب وقت ممكن وشكرا شكرا يا ورا تين لا بالابرا سو اكسلنسيا السنور بوي تان سون ministro de relaciones exteriores de vietnam tiene la palabra mr president I am honored to address the 49th session of the Council at the time when the world is at a crucial juncture. The COVID-19 pandemic is draining resources, disrupting economies, deepening existing divides and inequalities, effectively wiping out years of development progress. For the first time in decades, extreme poverty is once again on the rise. Meanwhile, violence and armed conflicts continue to break out and rage on in many areas, threatening peace, stability, and development, undermining prospect of a robust, sustainable recovery of the world economy. All this is on top of the existential threat of climate change and environmental degradation, which affects all nations and all peoples. At the same time, never before, humanity holds so much power enabled by advancement in technology and innovation to influence and determine the characters of the world we live in. Today's technologies, if we so choose, can foster connections and linkages to bring peoples and nations closer together and can enhance dialogue, understanding and cooperation to ensure peace, stability, prosperity, and to address the global challenges. We can choose to shift towards a green, circular, digital economy 
which empower people, improve livelihoods, and protect the environment. This opportunity urges us to build forward better, to ensure everyone is equal in the pursuit of happiness, freedom, and sustainable development, and that no one is left behind. Mr. President, this year marks the 45th anniversary of Vietnam's UN membership. But for 77 years since our nation's independence in 1945, Vietnam has been taking on unwavering commitment to delivering to our people the very values that the UN is striving for. People are at the heart of Vietnam's development strategy. They are both the chief beneficiary and the principal driver of Vietnam's development process. We seek to balance GDP growth with cultural and social progress, environmental protection, and climate resilience. This people-centric and holistic approach has enabled Vietnam to effectively tackle challenges. Vietnam's GDP growth in 2021 was 2.58% and is projected to accelerate to 5.5% this year. Poverty rate continues to fall and human development index keeps improving. Facing the pandemic with assistance from international partners, Vietnam has effectively launched the nation's largest ever vaccination campaign. Vietnam is now among the countries with the highest vaccination coverage with 97% adult population fully vaccinated. We are now preparing for a green and inclusive post-pandemic recovery. Mr. President, it was at this high level segment last year that Vietnam formally presented its candidature for membership of the Human Rights Council for the term 2023-2025. We pledge to make positive contributions to the work of the Council in the spirit of mutual respect, dialogue and cooperation, ensuring all human rights for all. We stand ready to work closely with other member states and stakeholders to uphold the principles of the UN Charter and the international law and strengthen the efficiency and effectiveness of the Human Rights Council through dialogue, cooperation, and mutual respect. We will promote the enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms in a comprehensive and holistic manner in all civil, political, economic, social, cultural, and developmental aspects. Our efforts will focus on particular on the protection of vulnerable groups and combating violence and discrimination against them. The promotion of gender equality, especially for women and girls in the era of digital transformation, and on protection and promotion of human rights in addressing global issues, especially climate change. And we will work to promote the right to health, particularly in the unpredictable context of COVID-19 and other communicable diseases. The right to descend to work in joint efforts to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the right to quality education based on equality, opportunity and universal access. We do look forward to receiving the valuable support of all UN member states and to work with all of you to build a better future for all. Thank you. Thank you. E agora tenho a honra de dar a palavra e convidar a sua excelência o senhor Rui Alberto Figueiredo Soares. Ministro de Assuntos Estrangeiros, Cooperação e Integração Regional do Cabo Verde. Bem-vindo. Tenha a palavra, Excelência.
Obrigado, Sr. Presidente, Excelências, distintos delegados, minhas senhoras e meus senhores. Sr. Presidente, começo por felicitar Vossa Excelência pela sua eleição como Presidente do Conselho e manifestar total disponibilidade da Delegação de Cabo Verde para colaborar consigo e com os demais membros do Conselho para reforçar o diálogo em matéria dos direitos humanos. Excelências, as questões que abordamos hoje neste Conselho, como as alterações climáticas, a violência e a igualdade entre homens e mulheres, os direitos humanos na era digital e os direitos das pessoas com deficiência, teriam sido imprevisíveis nas relações internacionais da história contemporânea. Embora tenhamos feito muitos progressos, há ainda muito trabalho por fazer. Reunimos-nos nesta sessão num contexto de pandemia e da de devastação causada pela Covid-19. O Conselho dos Direitos Humanos oferece, pois, importantes contributos para a construção de melhor renovação do contrato social, prevendo um caminho a seguir, não deixando ninguém para trás. Temos de aproveitar todas as oportunidades para alcançar uma recuperação inclusiva e sustentável e, para isso, temos de passar de medidas de mitigação temporárias para investimentos de longo prazo, ancorados numa perspectiva dos direitos humanos. Excelências, a pandemia da Covid-19 levou-nos aos nossos limites, testando a nossa resiliência em todos os setores da economia e áreas do desenvolvimento. Ao abordarmos os impactos da pandemia, é importante que reconheçamos o facto que os mais vulneráveis e marginalizados foram os mais atingidos. A pandemia desestabilizou e devastou os mais pobres das nossas comunidades, agravando as desigualdades existentes e invertendo os progressos na concretização dos Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável. Em 2021, muitos relatórios, diálogos e resoluções sublinharam a importância de uma cooperação internacional eficaz e de parcerias na resposta às consequências socioeconómicas da pandemia. No entanto, a pandemia não é apenas uma crise económica e de saúde, é também uma crise dos direitos humanos. É por isso imperativo que todos os esforços de resposta e recuperação para a pandemia da Covid-19 estejam centrados nos direitos humanos e promovam a proteção dos nossos cidadãos, em particular dos mais vulneráveis. O Conselho analisou o impacto negativo desproporcionado da pandemia nos direitos humanos das mulheres e das raparigas e salientou a importância de se prosseguir ativamente para alcançar a igualdade entre homens e mulheres. Por outro lado, a pandemia da Covid-19 e a gestão das vacinas contra esta doença exacerbaram uma série de questões relacionadas com a proteção e promoção dos direitos humanos, nomeadamente o direito à saúde. Com a disparidade existente no acesso às vacinas, é essencial que os esforços de resposta incluam a distribuição igual e justa das vacinas para todos. Sr. Presidente, para que a universalidade dos direitos humanos não seja apenas uma palavra vã, é essencial que todos tenhamos a oportunidade e o acesso à participação no Conselho dos Direitos Humanos. Para alguns Estados, especialmente aqueles que não têm representação em Genebra, a falta de recursos e logística podem, efetivamente, dificultar o envio de uma delegação ao Conselho. Por esta razão, o Fundo Fiduciário de Assistência Técnica Voluntária para apoiar a participação dos países menos desenvolvidos e dos CIDs, pequenos Estados Insulares em Desenvolvimento, esse mecanismo foi criado em 2012. Esse fundo, que funciona com contribuições voluntárias dos Estados-membros da ONU, foi a resolução mais patrocinada 
pelo Conselho dos Direitos Humanos desde a criação deste organismo em 2006, um recorde de 160 Estados-membros apoiaram esta decisão. Este mês assinala-se o décimo aniversário do Fundo Fiduciário, este importante marco que oferece uma oportunidade para refletirmos sobre as realizações alcançadas, sublinhar e reiterar a importância da participação universal de todos os Estados-membros das Nações Unidas no trabalho do Conselho dos Direitos Humanos. Em 2021, o Fundo apoiou 19 delegados dos CIDES e dos PMAs, 11 mulheres e 8 homens, promovendo deste modo a paridade de género no Conselho. Apesar dos obstáculos derivados pela pandemia da Covid-19, o Fundo facilitou dois workshops, workshops do Fundo Fiduciário Regional Virtual para as regiões africanas e asiáticas. Presentemente, 31 doadores já contribuíram para o Fundo, comparado com apenas dois em 2014. Embora as delegações tenham provavelmente notado o número crescente de delegações conjuntas dos CIDs, há ainda muito trabalho por fazer. O principal desafio continua a ser a assistência aos países menos avançados e aos CIDs, permitindo a sua participação ativa nos trabalhos do Conselho. Isto é particularmente importante à luz da pandemia da Covid-19, que atingiu duramente os países em desenvolvimento. Excelências, Sr. Presidente, Cabo Verde continua firme no compromisso assumido com a promoção e proteção dos direitos humanos. O papel dos Conselhos dos Direitos Humanos é hoje mais vital do que nunca. Hoje, período em que assistimos a uma guerra inesperada na Europa que tem consequências desastrosas sobre os direitos humanos e por isso Cabo Verde apela de facto a um cessar-fogo e ao entendimento entre as partes beligerantes através do diálogo e da via diplomática. Esta reunião do Conselho constitui, por isso, uma excelente oportunidade única, uma oportunidade de nos unirmos em solidariedade e prosseguirmos na recuperação sustentada e inclusiva com os direitos humanos no centro dos nossos esforços. asseguro o apoio contínuo da minha delegação nos trabalhos do Conselho e sucessos a esta 49ª sessão. Muito obrigado, Sr. Presidente. Muito obrigado pela vossa atenção. Muito obrigado, Sua Excelência, pela presença. Uh, and now I would like to I have the honor to invite to His Excellency Mr. Ahmed Khalil, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of the Maldives. His ex Your Excellency, you have the floor. Bismillah rahman rahim Mr. President, Madam High Commissioner, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, at the outset, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate you, Mr. President, on your election as the President of the 49th Session of the Human Rights Council. I wish you and your team a successful year ahead. Rest assured, as in previous sessions, the Maldives will continue to extend its full support to the Council under your able leadership. Mr. President, it will soon be two years since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Fortunately, the Maldives is on the road to recovery with strong public health and economic measures. More than 80% of the eligible population has been vaccinated, irrespective of their legal status or nationality. To achieve similar success on a global scale, it is important that the international community ensures equitable and affordable access to COVID-19 vaccines. Excellencies, the Maldives' foreign policy is based on three pillars, defending human rights, upholding the principles of democracy and good governance, and climate change. Since the adoption of the new constitu constitution in 2008, the Maldives has persistently advocated for human rights and 
fundamental freedom. Together with other small states, we have worked tirelessly to bring global attention to the existential threat of climate change and effects on the full enjoyment of human rights. We have worked hard to bring to forefront the human dimensions of climate change and have taken the lead on a series of resolutions on human rights and climate change, including early mandates such as Resolution 19 stroke 10, establishing the Special Repertoire on Human Rights and Environment. We are also proud to have been a lead co-sponsor of the historic landmark resolution 48 stroke 13, by which for the first time the Council recognized the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right. The adoption of resolution 48 stroke 14 on the creation of a special repertoire on the promotion and protection of human rights in the context of climate change is further testament to the importance that this Council now attaches to the human rights dimension of climate change. Excellencies, beyond, beyond advocating for environmental measures, the Maldives is engaged with human rights mechanisms on a broader scale. We are pleased to note that the Maldives' third cycle universal periodic review was conducted with the wide participation of the council members in 2020. This past year, the Maldives also completed its sixth periodic report review before the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Excellencies, the Maldives is a firm believer in the multilateral system and its importance for promoting peace and security. In this regard, we express our deep concern on the escalating security and humanitarian situation in Ukraine and calls on all concerned parties to uphold their obligations under international human rights and humanitarian law. We encourage the global community to engage in constructive dialogue pursuant to the United Nations Charter to ensure a swift and peaceful resolution to the conflict. We also wish to highlight our deep distress about the plight of the Palestinian people, particularly in the occupied territories. We will continue to support the right to a sovereign and independent Palestinian state. Excellencies, the Human Rights Council is a fundamental pillar of the international system. It is exceptionally critical now as we strive to place human rights at the core of the global recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. We are committed to engaging constructively with the Council and promoting diversity, inclusivity, and universality in the work of the Council. Since 2006, we have extended a standing invitation to all thematic special procedures mandate holders. To date, we have welcomed the special repertoire in the field of cultural rights and the special repertoire on torture and other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment. The special repertoire on the promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms while countering terrorism will visit the Maldives later this year, and we look forward to welcoming other mandate holders soon. The Maldives is fully committed to upholding the rule of law, strengthening democratic institutions, and promoting good governance. We have learned greatly from the democratic journey and, believe, and we believe that our own experience can provide a valuable perspective that is beneficial to the Council, especially from the point of view of a small island developing state. It is in this spirit that the Maldives has presented its candidature to the membership of the Human Rights Council for the term 2023 to 2025. We are committed to consolidating democracy at home and working towards a more inclusive, constructive, and diverse council. We pledge to offer a voice for the voiceless, the marginalized, and the smallest countries to ensure that no one is left behind. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank you, Your Excellency. And now, I have the pleasure to invite His Excellency, Mr. Dawda Ayelou, 
Attorney General and Minister of Justice of the Republic of the Gambia. You have the floor, Your Excellency. Mr. President, Excellencies, at the outset, allow me to convey warm greetings from the people and government of the Republic of the Gambia, and to also extend our gratitude to His Excellency, Mr. Abdullah Sahid, President of the General Assembly, His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Gotares, Secretary General of the United Nations, Hechi, Ms. Misele Bachelet, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and SEM uh, Ignacio Cassis, the President de la Confederation de Suisse, for participating in the 49th session of the Council. As we prepare to take our seat on this Council for the first time, it is an honor and privilege to lead my delegation at this historic session. In making these few remarks on behalf of the Gambia on this momentous day, allow me to assure members of this Council of our full commitment to the Council. As we congratulate uh, you, Your Excellency, we will assure you that we will give our unflinching support to the work of the Council throughout your presidency. The Gambia is indeed grateful to the entire membership of the General Assembly for the trust and support that led, our, that led to our election into this very important world body. Mr. President, Excellencies, with the firm conviction that human rights constitute an essential basis for peace, inclusion, and sustainable development, and the strengthening of the rule of law, the Gambia aspires to contribute to the work of the Council in promoting and supporting proposals that reinforce the efficiency of its organs, procedures, and mechanisms for the promotion and protection of human rights within the principles of transparency, collaboration, respect, and equality among states, as well as promoting cooperation, dialogue, justice, and international solidarity. Human rights and fundamental freedoms are an integral part of the institution established by the Gambian Constitution with a view to safeguarding human dignity as a common and intrinsic condition that applies to all persons subject to the jurisdiction of the state. The Gambia, as a host country of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, shall continue to cooperate and collaborate effectively and participate in the affairs of all established regional and sub-regional human rights treaty bodies. Mr. President, Excellencies, a people conscious of their moral and legal commitment to human dignity chose to champion once again the cause of democracy in the face of a dictatorship and brought a democratic change that ended 22 years of darkest horror in our history and replaced it with a representative and participatory administration under the leadership of His Excellency Mr. Adam Abaro, President of the Republic of the Gambia. Gambians chose a new beginning characterized by rule of law and transitional program sanctioned by the people. The vision for a new Gambia led to the creation of the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commission in 2018. The TRRC, which was established to create an impartial historical record of human rights violations committed for 22 years, has submitted its report in November 2021. This process of establishing truth with a view to bringing closure for a, na for a nation that was brutally violated and horribly scarred for more than two decades has taught Gambians important lessons that our country can never forget. Today, we have turned our past experiences into reconciliation and a commitment to the non-recurrence, never again. With our ambition to developing our nascent democratic institutions while strengthening the rule of law, we have also established a National Human Rights Commission as an independent oversight body to promote and protect human rights in the Gambia. Mr. President, Excellencies, as members of various multilateral institutions like this Council, with shared legal frameworks, 
we must stand up to our commitments and forge a united front against all forms of human rights abuses and violations wherever and whenever they occur. The Gambia will continue to pursue accountability for the Rohingya Muslim minorities in Myanmar and condemns all forms of discrimination, xenophobia, and intolerance against minority groups anywhere. We called for peaceful resolutions of every disagreement with a view to averting humanitarian disaster and catastrophic destructions of life and properties. We therefore called on Russia and Ukraine to immediately cease fire to avoid sufferings of innocent people and return to the negotiating table for peace. We call for dialogue and a diplomatic solution. Mr. President, Excellencies, the menace of COVID-19 pandemic affected all countries, but the, but the perilous economic and human rights challenges are most severe on the, develop, on, the, on the least developed countries than on the developed states. For this reason, this council must amplify its condemnation of the ongoing vaccine appetite and call for access as well as equal distribution of vaccines to the developing world. Climate change and environmental degradation continue to threaten our very existence as they adversely affect our natural habitation, livelihoods, and food security. All over the world, particularly in developing world, humanitarian crises are leading to human rights violations and displacements of people due to war, climate change, environmental degradation, related calamities, which are most often avoidable. We applaud the continued commitment of the Council in finding solutions to these problems. Mr. President, Excellencies, in conclusion, the Gambia warmly welcomes the Council's Resolution 1910, recognizing environmental degradation and climate change as interconnected human rights crises. As a nation with a proven commitment to cutting down emissions, we are committed to undertaking actions that contribute to keeping the world from exceeding Paris Agreement, goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. The Gambia continues to pursue the agenda of putting people first to achieve right to food, right to decent living, and right to safe, healthy, and sustainable environment. We also look forward to ensuring the effective implementation of this resolution to promote economic, social, and environmental policies actions that will protect people and nature. Let me reiterate our full commitment and support for the work of the Council. I wish you all a successful and fruitful 49th session. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And now I give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Simon Coveney, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Ireland. You have the floor, sir. Mr. President, High Commissioner, it's a privilege to address this Human Rights Council. And during this session, Ireland will engage with the full agenda of the Council. But today, I want to focus my remarks on the attacks on Ukraine. By invading Ukraine and violating its sovereignty and territorial integrity, the Russian Federation, facilitated by Belarus, is flagrantly violating the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Ireland condemns utterly the Russian Federation's further invasion of Ukraine. This military action has already resulted in severe violations of the civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights of the people of Ukraine. Civilians are bearing the brunt of this conflict. Every day we're witnessing rising casualties including the killing and injuring of children in planned, targeted attacks using heavy explosives in crowded cities. People's homes are being destroyed. Civilian infrastructure is being targeted. Hundreds of thousands of people are left without electricity, water or basic supplies. We have been shocked by the numbers of people, mainly women and children, fleeing their homes. And these numbers are likely to grow dramatically. The Russian Federation must comply with its obligations under international human rights law and international humanitarian law, and it must be held accountable for violations it has already committed.
Human rights obligations of Russia and Belarus apply equally within their own borders. We condemn the crackdowns on those exercising their fundamental freedoms, including those Russian and Belarusian citizens bravely protesting against these acts of war. The fundamental freedoms of expression, peaceful assembly and association must of course be protected. This crisis will only be resolved through political dialogue. We must see an end to Russia's assault on Ukraine, its people and its democratic institutions. Peace and security cannot be achieved without the full protection of human rights and the recognition of the centrality of international human rights law. We call for an immediate ceasefire, unconditional withdrawal of Russian troops, full respect for human rights and accountability for violations committed. The foundation on which this council is built is being challenged. Now is the time to live up to our responsibilities and Ireland stands in full solidarity with the people of Ukraine and I urge all council members to do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, I, uh, ahora le doy la palabra a su excelencia, el señor Yeyun Bayramov, ministro de Asuntos Extranjeros de Azerbaiyán. Tiene la palabra. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to congratulate His Excellency Ambassador Federico Villegas on his appointment as the President of the Human Rights Council. Our discussion takes place under the shadow of increased tension in international relations amidst the serious deterioration of situation in and around Ukraine. Azerbaijan deeply regrets that the ongoing crisis continues to cause significant casualties, in, part in particular among civilians. Civilian lives and civilian infrastructure must be protected and safeguarded, and human rights must be respected at all times. The evolving humanitarian crisis on the ground requires expedient measures to alleviate the impact of current situation on civilians. Proceeding from this understanding, Azerbaijan has already rendered on a bilateral basis humanitarian assistance of medicine and medical equipment and other first need essentials to the people of Ukraine. At this critical time, Azerbaijan reiterates its call for dialogue without delay to prevent the situation from further escalating and underlines the necessity of direct negotiations between the parties. Dear colleagues, 2022 marks the 30th anniversary of Azerbaijan accession to the United Nations. Azerbaijan has already been advocating for an efficient UN and is committed to the principles of the UN Charter, multilateralism and increased cooperation with the UN bodies, including the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and other human rights mechanisms based on mutual dialogue and genuine respect. As one of the founding members of the Human Rights Council, Azerbaijan continues its support to the HRC as a credible and responsible global human rights body. Despite challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic in the work of the treaty bodies, we agreed to the voluntary virtual review in relation to Azerbaijan's force national report under the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and third national report under the International Convention on Migrant Workers. Currently, Azerbaijan is among 25 member states which have no overdue reports. Azerbaijan has always been advocating for the cooperation between the special procedures mandate holders and the states based on constructive dialogue and mutual trust. We recognize the important role of the mandate holders in promoting human rights. With this in mind, my government has extended standing invitation to all special procedures mandate holders and has welcomed a number of them in the country. We emphasize that all special procedures mandate holders in discharging their mandate shall be guided by the UN Charter, respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states and the code of conduct of the special procedure mandate holders. Azerbaijan, in this capacity, as the chair of the non-aligned movement, has initiated a platform for dialogue between the non-member states and the special procedures mandate holders, which will be an opportunity for constructive interaction and will contribute to the common efforts dedicated to protection and promoting of human rights. 
In 2021, the chairmanship of the Republic of Azerbaijan in the non-aligned movement was successfully continued. Azerbaijan initiated launching of the youth network and parliamentary network of the movement, which will contribute respectively to the intensification of contacts among the youth and the development of inter-parliamentary cooperation. Promotion and protection of all universally recognized human rights, in particular the right to development, is very important for the NAM. This year, Azerbaijan will present a draft resolution on the commemoration of the 31st anniversary of the Declaration on the Right to Development and in cooperation with the OHCHR, will organize a series of events on this occasion. Committed to the realization of the 23rd Agenda, during the UN High-Level Political Forum, on sustainable development, Azerbaijan presented its NET's next voluntary national review. Among the countries of the region, the Republic of Azerbaijan was the first one to submit the third report on the implementation of the UN Agenda for Sustainable Development until 2030. The Republic of Azerbaijan has worked with other members of the world community to seek and provide effective responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Regretfully, the pandemic has further exacerbated existing inequalities within and among developing and developed countries, affecting the poorest countries the most. To address serious concerns over the persisting vaccine nationalism, during current session of the Council, Azerbaijan, on behalf of the NAM, together with Ecuador, will again present a draft resolution on ensuring equitable, universal access for all countries to vaccines. Last March, the resolution on the same topic was adopted unanimously by the Council. This resolution was also adopted at the 76th session of the UN General Assembly with the support of an absolute majority of UN member states. Let me also express gratitude to the states who supported this initiative. We hope that this year's resolution will also be adopted by consensus. Strengthening democracy and protection of human rights are among top priorities of the Republic of Azerbaijan. The ongoing reforms carried out in the country encompass a wide range of activities including adoption of new relevant legislative acts, improvement of social protection of the population, particularly of vulnerable groups, support to the development of media. The new media law, which entered into force about a month ago, will expand the scope of activities in the media field, protect the rights of the media entities, and guarantee media freedom and freedom of opinion and expression. The latest Amnesty Act of November 2021 is envisaged to apply to around 17,000 people, including the release of 3,000 convicted persons. Azerbaijan has entered a strategic phase in the post-conflict era. The government has set the country's long-term development target for social, economic and environment development through national priorities. These priorities include, among others, inclusive and social justice, great return of Azerbaijani IDPs to the liberated territories, and clean environment and green growth country. Developing self-sustaining environmental practices to ensure environmental safety is an integral part of Azerbaijan's sustainable development concept. After restoration of territorial integrity, the government of Azerbaijan has already embarked on the transforming the liberated territories into environmentally friendly green energy zones and to build smart cities and smart villages. Currently, Azerbaijan is expecting the UNEP mission to its liberated territories. The end of the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan creates new economic opportunities, not only for Azerbaijan, but also for the region. In this regard, rehabilitation and reconstruction of the liberated territories will be one of the main directions of the development priority of Azerbaijan in coming years. 1.3 billion US dollars have been already spent from the state budget for these purposes in 2021. The task facing Azerbaijan in restoring these areas was eyewitnessed by the UNHCR during its mission to our country last year, the aim of which was to discuss the conditions and prospects for the return of IDPs and refugees. Massive contamination of liberated territories with landmines and other explosive devices by Armenia is a major impediment to safe and dignified return of thousands of hundreds of Azerbaijani displaced persons to their lands and restoration of their rights. The Azerbaijani National Agency for Mine Action is charged with coordinating activities of demining, mine risk education and victim assistance 
Accuracy of only 25% of all maps of mined areas released by Armenia has not contributed much to the acceleration of the demining process. The process is going on. However, we are still losing people. Since the end of the conflict, around 200 people have become victims of mine explosions. The harsh consequences of culture seed committed by Armenia has been revealed in full scale after the liberation of Azerbaijani territories from Armenian occupation. For more than 20 years, the Republic of Azerbaijan has repeatedly called on UNESCO to implement mission to then occupy territories of Azerbaijan. However, this mission was prevented due to the occupation of these territories by the Armenian military forces. The fact is reflected in the UNESCO activities report published in 2005. The Azerbaijani historical, cultural and religious heritage in Armenia shared the same fate as the heritage in the then occupied territories, the facts about which has been repeatedly brought to the attention of UNESCO and the international community by Azerbaijan. On numerous occasions, Azerbaijan at the highest level has declared its determination to preserve, restore, restore and put into operation all cultural and religious monuments in the liberated territories irrespective of their origin. Our strong track record in promoting multiculturalism, both at home and abroad, is a guarantee in this regard. In conclusion, let me once again recall that Azerbaijan is interested in cooperation with relevant international partners, including UN and its agencies, as well as individual sta states, which are willing to contribute to peace, stability and development in the region. The position of Azerbaijan in this regard is based on international law, relevant resolution and documents regulating UN's activities in the fields of humanitarian assistance, post-conflict rehabilitation and reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And now I give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. George Simbashawene, Minister for Constitutional and Legal Affairs of the United Republic of Tanzania. You have the floor. Mr. President, High Commissioner, distinguished excellencies, it is with great pleasure that I address this esteemed body and extend greetings from Her Excellency Samia Sulu Hassan, the President of the United Republic of Tanzania, who has placed the promotion and the protection of human rights at the forefront of the development agenda. On behalf of the people and the government of the United Republic of Tanzania, I congratulate you, Mr. President, on your election as the President of the Human Rights Council. I wish to ensure you of the full support of the United Republic of Tanzania as you take on the noble undertaking of, the, of steering the Human Rights Council central role in the promotion and the protection of human rights. We also commend the High Commissioner, Madame Michelle Bachelet, and her global team for unwavering dedication towards the international human rights agenda. Mr. President, we applaud the Council for proceeding with its program of work despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic and the spirit of cooperation whereby states have continued to engage with the Council. Indeed, Tanzania takes its obligation with the, with the Human Rights Council seriously. In this regard, the United Republic of Tanzania engaged with the Council in November 2021 when our third national report under the Universal Periodic Review Mechanism was considered. We are pleased to have gone through the assessment with the adoption of our UPR outcomes during this session of the Human Rights Council. Mr. President, the United Republic of Tanzania recently celebrated 60 years of independence on the 9th of December 2021. This was a time of great reflection for the country with each minister disseminating sectoral achievements and challenges over the past six decades through press conferences to the public in consideration of the good governance principles of transparency and accountability, including the promotion and protection of human rights. Notable achievements over this period include holding multi-party democratic election 
every five years in compliance with our constitution, being categorized a middle-income country by the World Bank five years before this objective of the National Development Agenda, Vision 2025, and maintaining a unique union between two states, being Tanzania mainland and Zanzibar, and importantly, remaining a peaceful and a stable nation. Mr. President, the United Republic of Tanzania, like the rest of the world, has had to adopt response measures to the COVID-19 pandemic in recognition of the right to health and in consideration of the socio-economic ramifications of the pandemic. The, we placed human rights at the core of response measures and a holistic approach was adopted. Therefore, when the United Republic of Tanzania secured Tanzanian shillings 1.3 trillion, approximately 600 US dollar million, as a COVID relief funds from the IMF in 2021, they were collectively used for construction of health facilities, school and dormitories, drilling wells for clean potable water, empowerment of entrepreneurs, specifically the youth, women, and the persons with disabilities, and for supporting the poor household empowerment program. The government also began a nationwide campaign to encourage vaccination in 2021. The United Republic of Tanzania has adopted a strategic multi-pronged approach to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. President, the government continues to promote the right to education through the fee-free education policy and in November 2021, strengthened access to education for all without discrimination by allowing students who are dropped out of school for specific reasons to continue with their studies. This also includes re-entry for female students who dropped out of school due to pregnancy, which was formally issued in Education Secular Number 2 of 2021. In July 2021, the government committed itself to the Campaign on Economic Justice and Right to Coalition for Action. This is being spearheaded by a National Advisory Committee launched in December 2021 by Her Excellency, the President, to oversee the implementation of the government's commitments, which will support poverty alleviation and economic uplifting of women. Mr. President, the government is equally steadfast in ensuring that civil and political rights are respected and a, a favorable political environment continues to be maintained. In this regard, Mr. President, the government held high-level talks with leaders of political parties and the stakeholders involved in the democracy and the good governance matters in a meeting officiated by Her Excellency the President in December 2021. This is part of concerted efforts to ensure that fundamental democratic rights and freedoms continues to be realized in Tanzania. Indeed, the right to freedom of expression and the right to information remain central to our democracy. To further this open and frank discussion with the media houses and the practitioners are ongoing to ensure that journalists rights are protected. This has led to reopening of online TVs, relicensing of newspapers, and the discussions over law reform of media laws is going on. Mr. President, the government does not appear operate in ISOs in its efforts towards promoting and protecting the human rights of the people of Tanzania. The government continues to strengthen ties with the National Human Rights Institution, civil society organizations, and the development partners as we share similar objectives, which is the realization of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all. I therefore take this opportunity to reaffirm the enduring commitment of the United Republic of Tanzania towards meeting its obligations to Human Rights Council. I wish you all a fruitful session Thank you, Asante Sam. Thank you, Your Excellency. And now I give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Evariste Bartolo, 
Minister for Foreign Affairs and European uh, Foreign and European Affairs of Malta. You have the floor. Mr. President, High Commissioner, Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, I wish to begin by congratulating Ambassador Federico Villegas, permanent representative of Argentina, on his election as president of the Human Rights Council for this year. I wish him well for his term in office and assure him of our full support. Mr. President, Malta continues to strenuously support the UN human rights system and reasserts that human rights are universal, indivisible, interdependent and interrelated. We reiterate our full support to the HRC and its work, including special procedures and their work in ensuring accountability and justice. Our definition of human rights should embrace political, social and economic rights so that all people on this planet can live decently and with dignity and free from fear and want. We need to bind together people, planet, prosperity and peace. We cannot have human rights without peace. At the time when we should be pulling together to recover from the pandemic and address the climate crisis, we now have the sad human tragedy of the aggression against the people of the Ukraine. The killing must stop. The guns must be silenced and we must talk to each other and find ways of living together. Difficult, yes, but not impossible if we have the goodwill to recognize our shared humanity on this tiny and fragile planet. We live in a world where the top 1% have nearly 10, 20 times more of global wealth and the bottom 50% of humanity. Every four seconds, a person dies of hunger. Even during the pandemic, military budgets have continued to increase but not enough money was found to vaccinate all the world and save millions from death and other millions from being plunged into poverty. Mr. President, my government will continue to prioritize gender issues in our implementation of human rights and stresses the need to promote and protect women's and girls' full enjoyment of human rights. In line with the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, we consider the inclusion of women at every level of governance including peace, mediation and negotiations, an essential element in prevention and recovery efforts. It is clear that including women who represent half the global population in these structures will benefit the whole of society. Malta continues to take gender equality issues seriously. Last year, Parliament approved a bill which introduces a gender quota for honorable members intended to increase gender equality in parliamentary representation. Mr. President, protection of freedoms of opinion and expression is a hallmark of a free society. We are deeply concerned that journalists around the world continue to be targeted and we remain committed to ensuring their safety and protection. In this regard, judicial proceedings in the Daphne Caruana Galizia case are progressing. My government remains fully committed to bring all perpetrators to justice. In line with the conclusions of the public inquiry related to this case, we have also set up an expert committee to make recommendations to strengthen the protection of journalists in full consultation with all stakeholders. We welcome and support the valuable work undertaken by civil society organizations and human rights defenders in the promotion and protection of human rights, particularly through their central role at this Council. Mr. President, the Council has continued to make important strides in identifying the causes of violence and discrimination against people due to their sexual orientation and gender identity. Malta will continue to place special emphasis on promoting the human rights of LGBTIQ persons at the multilateral level. Nationally, we have also taken similar steps as part of the LGBT plus equality strategy and action plans implementation for 2018-2022. For the sixth year in a row, Malta continues to top the ILGA Europe Rainbow Organization rankings, which encourage us to do more. Malta will continue to advocate for the prevention and elimination of racism, xenophobia and related intolerance. And last year we adopted our first anti-racism strategy, aiming to confront and eliminate racism in all its forms. Mr. President, in conclusion, we reiterate our unwavering support to High Commissioner Bachelet and her office. We call on all states to ensuring adequate funding and to extend their cooperation and protect the independence of the office of the High Commissioner. My hope for this year is for all UN members, especially HRC members, to uphold the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights. Only by doing so will we be in a position to face and eventually overcome 
the global challenges that which we are all faced for the benefit of all. The best way to promote human rights is to practice them at home and continue developing and lead by example rather than through self-righteous crusades against other countries. Instead, we should try to understand each other as human beings through learning about each other's culture and history to see ourselves as, hum as equal human beings and with equal human, political, economic and social rights for a decent life with dignity on our planet. Thank you. Thank you. And now I have the honor to give the floor and invite His Excellency Sheikh Ahmedou, Commissioner of the Human Rights and Relations with the Civil Society of Mauritania. His Excellency, you have the floor. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على نبيه الكريم السيد رئيس مجلس حقوق الإنسان الموقر السيد المفاوض المفاوضة السامية لحقوق الإنسان السادة والسيدات الوزراء أصحاب السعادة السفراء ومندوبي دول السادة والسيدات ممثلي منظمات الدولية والإقليمية السادة والسيدات ممثلي المؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان ومنظمات المجتمع المدني أيها السادة والسيدات يطيب لي بداية أن أعبر باسم حكومة, حكومة الجمهورية الإسلامية الموريتانية عن أخلص التهاني وأطيب التمنيات لمجلسنا الموقر والمفوضية السامية لحقوق الإنسان على العمل الجبار الذي ما فتئوا يقومون به من أجل ترقية وحماية حقوق الإنسان وصيانة كرامته في كافة أنحاء العالم سيد الرئيس على الرغم من الجهود الكبيرة وحجم المنجز في مجال حقوق الإنسان فإن عالمنا ما يزال يواجه مجموعة من العوائق والتحديات الجمة التي تقف حجر عثرة دون تطبيق العديد من المعاهدات ذات الصلة ودون تمتع البعض بأبسط حقوقه الأساسية والضرورية ولعل من بين تلك العوائق والتحديات على سبيل المثال للحصر النزاعات والتهريب والإرهاب والتطرف العنيف والهجرة السرية والتأثيرات المناخية والمتاجرة بالبشر وفي هذا الإطار لم تزل بلادنا تقوم بجهود حثيثة على المستويين الدولي والإقليمي للمساهمة الفعلية في حل النزاعات والاستقبال وإيواء النازحين وطالب اللجوء ورفع التحديات عن طريق سياسات متنوعة ومقاربة أمنية شاملة سعيا للتصدي للإرهاب والتطرف والجريمة المنظمة العابرة للحدود وخاصة في إطار مجموعة دول الساحل الخمس سيد الرئيس يشهد العالم منذ عامين تحديا كونيا كبيرا تمثل في جائحة كوفيد 19 التي ما زلنا نعيش تداعيتها أثرت بشكل كبير على البرامج الاقتصادية وعلى أنماط العيش المعتاد بفضل السياسات المحكمة التي اتبعتها بلادنا لتسيير الأزمة تم منح الأولوية لإعمال الحقوق الاقتصادية والاجتماعية خاصة لصالح الفئات الهشة من السكان وقامت بإطلاق برامج كبرى من بينها برنامج الأولويات والبرنامج الرعوي الخاص وخطة التضامن الوطني والتصدي لجائحة كوفيد-19 سيد الرئيس عرفت حالة, الحقوق حالة حقوق الإنسان في بلادنا تقدما ملحوظا في مجال ترقية وحماية الحقوق المدنية والسياسية والاقتصادية والاجتماعية تعززت معها مكانة موريتانيا بين مصاف الأمم الساعية بجد إلى بناء دولة القانون والمؤسسات والترسيخ الديمقراطية وحقوق الإنسان والترقية والصون مفاهيم الحرية بما يضمن بناء الإنسان الحر المالكي زمام إرادته وفي هذا السياق تم لأول مرة إطلاق مسار إعداد استراتيجية وطنية لترقية وحماية حقوق الإنسان في البلد وفي مسار تشاوري بالتعاون مع مكتب المفوضية السامية للأمم المتحدة لحقوق الإنسان في بلادنا سيد الرئيس شهد الإطار القانوني والمؤسسي لترقية وحماية حقوق الإنسان تطورا نوعيا من خلال مصادقة على نصوص تشريعية جديدة عززت حماية الحقوق والحريات كالقانون 00-2021 المتعلق بالجمعيات والهيئات وبالشبكات الذي يكرس لأول مرة نظام التصريح للجمعيات بدل الترخيص ومن خلال إنشاء المرصد الوطني لحقوق المرأة والفتاة 
كما تتم استحداث جائزة وطنية لتشجيع المدافعين عن حقوق الإنسان وتعزيز اللحمة الاجتماعية وفي مجال محاربة العبودية والاتجار بالبشر نظمت حكومة بلادي طاولة مستديرة حول إنفاذ القانون 031-2015 المجرم للعبودية والمعاقب للممارسات الاستعبادية أسفرت عن صياغة توصيات واقتراح حول, حول إنفاذ القانون كما توجت بإصدار تعميم وزاري مشترك يحث القائمين على إنفاذ القانون على اتخاذ التدابير اللازمة المنصوص عليها في القوانين لضمان مصدر قضائية فاعلة علاوة على تنظيم ورشات تكوينية وحملات تحسيسية حول التشريعات لصالح السلطات الإدارية والقضائية والأمنية ومنظمات المجتمع المدني سيد الرئيس في إطار تعزيز الحقوق الاقتصادية والاجتماعية واصلت الحكومة تنفيذ برنامج أولويات موسع الذي يحتوي على أكبر عدد من المشاريع المتزامنة في تاريخ البلد يهدف هذا البرنامج إلى رفع قوة الشرائية للمواطنين وتحسين الولوج للخدمات الأساسية وخلق فرص للعمل وقد استفاد منه ما يقارب 50% من السكان كما تم توسيع الرعاية والتأمين الصحيين ليشمل ما يقارب 16% من الأسر المتعففة وتدشين 64 بنية تحتية مدرسية مكتملة وإطلاق برنامج الكفالات المدرسية وهو ما يعكس بوضوح الأهمية التي توليها السلطات العليا لترقية التعليم والصحة ولتقليص الفوارق الاجتماعية ومكافحة الغبن والتفاوت بين فئات المجتمع وفي ذات السياق تم استحداث هيئات وبرامج غايتها دمج وتكوين ومساعدة الفئات التي ظلت مهمشة ومغبونة كي تتبوأ المكان اللائق في المجتمع وهو ما أكد عليه فخامة رئيس الجمهورية سيد محمد والشيخ الغزواني في خطاب وادان الشهير حيث حث على تجاوز رواسب هذا الظلم في موروثنا الثقافي وتطهير الخطاب والمسركيات من الأحكام المسبقة والصور النمطية الزائفة مضيفا أنه ليس ثمة ما هو أقدر على حماية الفرد وصون كرامته وحقوقه من وحدة وطنية راسخة في كنف دولة قانون حديثة وقد لاقى هذا الخطاب صدا واسعا وتفاعلا في مختلف أوساط فئات المجتمع سيد الرئيس إن بلادنا ماضية بجد وبكل الوسائل في, تمسك في تمسكها بالتزامات الدولية في مجال حقوق الإنسان وقد تجسد ذلك في تعاطيها الإيجابي والمستمر مع كافة الهيئات والآليات الأممية والإقليمية المختصة ولعل مرور بلادنا الأخير أمام آلية الاستعراض الدوري الشامل ومشاركتها في حوار تفاعلي مع فريق العمل الخاص بالاختفاء القصري أمور بين أخرى تشهد على الإرادة الصادقة والديناميكية الملحوظة التي يعرفها مسار العلاقة مع هذه الهيئات وتنتظر في الأشهر وننتظر في الأشهر القادمة زيارة المقرر الخاص المعني بالأشكال المعاصرة للرق ورئيسة فريق العمل المعني بحقوق المرأة والفتاة سيد الرئيس اسمحوا لي أن أذمن باسم الحكومة الموريتانية جهود كافة هيئات الأمم المتحدة المواكبة والداعمة لبلادنا في مجال حقوق الإنسان وخاصة مكتب المفوضية السامية لحقوق الإنسان في بلادنا وكذا المؤسسات الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان ومنظمات الدفاع عن حقوق الإنسان التي تمثل مشاركتها وبفعالية مؤشرا مهما على المكانة التي تتمتع بها والدور الكبير الذي بات ينتظر منها سواء على مستوى التعبئة أو التثقيف أو المشورة وختاما أعرب لكم عن حرص السلطات العليا في بلادنا على المضي قدما في مواكبة كافة الجهود الرامية إلى حفظ وصيانة كرامة الإنسان متمنيا لأعمال دورتنا التوفيق والنجاح أشكركم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته شكرا Now, eh, y ahora le doy la palabra a su excelencia la señora Wafa Bani Mustafa ministra de estado para asuntos legales de Jordania tiene la palabra Wafa Bani Mustafa wazir dawla al-shu'un al-qanuniya al-urdun 
خضت النساء الأردنيات كما هو حال النساء في كل العالم الكثير من التحديات والصعوبات والنضالات من أجل الوصول إلى الحقوق والحريات والمكتسبات حققت النساء عبر الحقب الزمنية المتتالية الكثير إلى أن أمامهن أيضا الكثير لتحقيقه أبطأتنا الجائحة كما فعلت بكل دول العالم إلى أن القرار الشجاع من جلالة الملك عبد الله الثاني بن الحسين في أواخر عام 2021 بتشكيل اللجنة الملكية لتحديث المنظومة السياسية أعطانا دفعة قوية وفرصة حقيقية من أجل مراجعة التشريعات الخاصة بالنساء وخاصة السياسية منها فكانت التعديلات الدستورية التي دخلت حيز النفاذ في 31/1/2022 والتي جاءت على النحو التالي حيث تم إضافة كلمة الأردنيات إلى عنوان الفصل الثاني من الدستور ليصبح الفصل بعنوانه الجديد حقوق الأردنيين والأردنيات وواجباتهم كذلك تم إجراء التعديلات وإضافة الفقرات خمسة وستة وسبعة على المادة السادسة لنكون أمام لحظة تاريخية هامة في تاريخ حقوق النساء في الأردن حيث تم النص صراحة على حماية النساء من كافة أشكال العنف والتمييز في الوثيقة الأسماء ألا وهي الدستور هذا بالإضافة إلى نهج تشريعي متواصل يعزز حقوق المرأة وحمايتها فكان هنالك قانون جديد لمنع الإتجار بالبشر في عام 2021 نص صراحة على حماية المجني عليهم والحفاظ على سلامتهم الجسدية والمعنوية والنفسية بالإضافة إلى حقهم في التعويض العادل عن الضرر المادي والمعنوي هذا بالإضافة إلى قانون للحماية من العنف الأسري نص صراحة ولأول مرة على إلزامية التبليغ في قضايا العنف الأسري من قبل مقدمي الخدمات وفرض غرامة على من لم يقوم بذلك وكذلك إنشاء نظام يقوم على حماية الشهود والمبلغين كذلك كان الحال في قوانين أخرى متعددة مثل قانون الإدارة المحلية الذي نص صراحة على أن يكون هنالك مقاعد مخصصة للنساء بنسبة 25% في البلديات و25% بمجالس المحافظات إضافة إلى التعديلات في قانون الضريبة العامة وضريبة الدخل حيث كان هنالك اعتراف لأول مرة بالمرأة المعيلة. إضافة إلى تعديلات في قانون العمل تساعد وتعزز مشاركة النساء الاقتصادية حيث كان هنالك تعريف للعمل المرن والعمل الجزئي إضافة إلى تجريم للتمييز في الأجر على أساس الجنس في حالة العمل ذو القيمة المتساوية إضافة إلى إعطاء أبناء الأردنيات الحق في العمل بدون تصاريح عمل وإضافة إلى إلزامية إنشاء حضانات الأطفال عبر المادة 72 في أماكن العمل هناك الكثير مما تم إنجازه على هذا الصعيد ولكن لدينا أيضا كحكومة عدد كبير من المشاريع التي نعمل عليها الآن فهنالك مشروع قانون جديد للأحزاب يقوم هذا القانون على إعطاء النساء واشتراط النساء بنسبة 20% من المؤسسين في حال تأسيس حزب و20% للشباب وهذا بحد ذاته دافع حقيقي لتشجيع النساء والشباب على الانخراط في الحياة السياسية إضافة إلى إيجاد مواد في قانون الأحزاب الجديد الموجود حاليا لدى مجلس النواب باشتراط ان تكون النساء والشباب والاشخاص ذوي الاعاقه في المواقع القياديه في الحزب واشتراط ان يكون هنالك اليه تضمن وصول النساء والشباب والاشخاص ذوي الاعاقه الى موارد الحزب بصوره متساويه ومتكافئه مع باقي الاعضاء وخاصه اثناء الانتخابات. كذلك هنالك مشروع جديد بقانون الانتخاب هذا المشروع يقدم عدد من المكتسبات للنساء حيث تم رفع المقاعد المخصصة للنساء في القوائم المحلية من 15 إلى 18 لتصبح هنالك امرأة أو مقعد مخصص للنساء عن كل دائرة انتخابية أيضا 
ولأننا قمنا باختراح القوائم الحزبية لأول مرة في الأردن أيضا اشترطنا أن تكون المرأة من أول ثلاث ومن ثاني ثلاث في الستة مقاعد الأولى وأن يكون هنالك شاب أو شابة ضمن الخمسة مقاعد الأولى وهذا بحد ذاته أيضا تشجيع للأحزاب السياسية وللنساء وللشباب على الانخراط بالحياة السياسية بصورة جادة ومهمة أيضا كان هنالك تعديلات مهمة تم إرسالها إلى مجلس النواب وهي تعديلات مهمة مثل قانون التنفيذ مشروع قانون التنفيذ الذي ينص صراحة في أحد مواده على عدم جواز حبس المدين عن الديون المدنية الناتجة عن التزام تعاقدي في تعديل واضح يتماشى مع العهد الدولي للحقوق المدنية والسياسية وتحديدا المادة 11 منه وأيضا تعديل في قانون العقوبات حيث تم التوسع في بدائل العقوبات المجتمعية بدلا عن العقوبات السالبة للحرية وأيضا قانون العمل الذي ينص صراحة في تعديلاته الجديدة على تجريم التحرش في أماكن العمل وأيضا على رفع القيود عن أوقات عمل النساء والمهن المحظورة لعمل النساء فيها بصورة كاملة في أواخر عام 2020 أطلقنا حملة لحماية النساء من العنف السياسي فكان الدليل الإجرائي الأول في المنطقة من أجل حماية النساء من العنف السياسي وأيضا الفريق الوطني بمشاركة 17 خبير من أجل تقديم الاستشارات للنساء اللواتي يتعرضن إلى العنف السياسي فخورة أنني أنتمي إلى بلد الأردن البلد المعروف بإنسانيته الذي نشأت فيه وترعرعت على مقولة الراحل العظيم الحسين الإنسان أغلى ما نمي Gran. Y ahora le doy la palabra a su excelencia, la señora Ana Luisa Castro, viceministra eh, de Asuntos Multilaterales y Cooperación de Panamá. Señor presidente, señora alta comisionada, señoras y señores, deseo felicitar al embajador Federico Villegas, por su elección como presidente del Consejo de Derechos Humanos y reiterarle el respaldo de Panamá en la implementación de las prioridades trazadas para este ciclo. Nos encontramos en un punto de inflexión caracterizado por múltiples desafíos, incluyendo la pandemia del COVID-19, la crisis climática y ambiental, la pobreza, los conflictos armados y la inseguridad alimentaria. Todo ello ha exacerbado las tensiones y las desigualdades en todo el mundo, exponiendo a determinados grupos de personas a un estado de gran vulnerabilidad y marginación. Abordar estos retos es un imperativo de derechos humanos, de desarrollo y de seguridad internacional. Esto implica un cambio de paradigma basado en los derechos humanos y en la igualdad de género, un nuevo contrato social entre los gobiernos, la sociedad civil y otros interlocutores, prestando especial atención a los grupos de personas que han sufrido formas múltiples de discriminación y proponiendo a su vez una relación más armoniosa entre los seres humanos y la naturaleza. Hoy, más que nunca, el Consejo de Derechos Humanos debe cumplir con la misión de proteger y promover el respeto universal de los derechos humanos y las libertades fundamentales de todas las personas, sin distinción de ningún tipo, incluso en situaciones de emergencia. En el 2021 se constató la capacidad que tiene este órgano para adoptar un enfoque de prevención al celebrarse un número récord de sesiones especiales. Asimismo, se adoptaron importantes iniciativas, entre ellas el reconocimiento del derecho humano a un medio ambiente limpio, saludable y sostenible. La relativa al acceso equitativo y universal a las vacunas en la respuesta a pandemias y otras emergencias sanitarias y el establecimiento de un nuevo mecanismo para combatir el racismo sistémico. Durante el 48 octavo periodo de sesiones, Panamá, junto a Bahamas, Fiji, Islas Marshall, Paraguay, Sudán y la Unión Europea, presentamos la resolución 4814, 
por la cual se establece un relator especial sobre la promoción y la protección de los derechos humanos en el contexto del cambio climático. Esta resolución representa un hito en la lucha contra una de las mayores amenazas que enfrenta la humanidad. Estos esfuerzos, junto con la Alianza Carbono Negativo y la Declaración para la Conservación de los Ecosistemas del Corredor Marino del Pacífico Este Tropical, son un reflejo de nuestra diplomacia climática y responden a un concepto verde y azul de la política exterior y la consolidación de Panamá como líder mundial azul. También formamos parte de diversas plataformas, destacando la Coalición Internacional para la Igualdad Salarial, EPIC, y la Alianza para el Desarrollo en Democracia. Hemos creado espacios en el ámbito bilateral, regional y multilateral para resaltar la urgencia de adoptar un enfoque integral que permita explorar áreas de cooperación y encontrar soluciones compartidas para atender la crisis humanitaria de los migrantes irregulares y los países de acogida. Nuestro actuar en el Consejo de Derechos Humanos continuará basado en la universalidad, interdependencia e interrelación de los derechos humanos, el estricto apego al derecho internacional, el respeto al principio de la soberanía de los estados y la libre determinación de los pueblos. Participaremos igualmente activamente en las negociaciones de las resoluciones sobre las personas con discapacidad, los defensores de los derechos humanos, la lucha contra el terrorismo, el cambio climático y el impacto de las transferencias de armas, así como en la renovación de los mandatos sobre los derechos de las mujeres, los adultos mayores, los pueblos indígenas, el agua potable y el saneamiento. Por último, seguiremos haciendo eco del llamado del Secretario General para la prohibición global sobre los sistemas de armas autónomas. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Y ahora tiene la palabra su excelencia, señor Lasha Garzalia, primer viceministro de Relaciones Exteriores de Georgia. Tiene la palabra. Mr. President, at the outset, let me wish you and the Bureau every success in your endeavors in these extraordinary circumstances. Excellencies, as we meet today, the rules-based international order remains under attack, and the key, key tenets of the UN Charter and the Helsinki Final Act are bluntly violated. The use of armed forces by your UN member state against sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of another member state violates Article 2.4 of the UN Charter and constitutes an act of aggression, as defined by the Resolution 3314 of the UN General Assembly, adopted by consensus. What we see in Ukraine is an act of aggression on the part of Russia, and we condemn it. It is deeply alarming that international norms and principles that we all committed to uphold are repeatedly violated by the permanent member of the Security Council whose primary responsibility is to do the exact opposite, act as the guardian of peace and security. It is unacceptable that the sovereign right of the state to choose its security guarantees is subject to punishment. As we speak, Russia's indiscriminate military attack against Ukraine is ongoing, inflicting horrific human suffering, massive violations of fundamental human rights, civilian casualties, and forced displacement. As a part of hybrid warfare, military assaults are accompanied by disinformation campaign and cyber attacks. In these difficult times, we express our strongest solidarity with the people of Ukraine. We deplore the loss of life and human suffering. Dear colleagues, this is the time when we all have to be united in defending the very fundamentals of the international law. Accountability for violations and abuses of human rights and violations of international humanitarian law must be ensured. Georgia is a stronger advocate for the Council's vital role, voices its strong support to the Council's upcoming urgent debate on the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Georgia has co-sponsored this subsequent resolution. We reiterate our unwavering support to the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders, including Crimea and Donbas, and Ukraine's navigational lines in its territorial waters. 
We call on the Russian Federation to immediately, completely, and without any preconditions, seize its military activities and withdraw all its forces and armaments from the territory of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Allow immediate, safe, and unfettered access to all international humanitarian and human rights mechanisms wherever is needed on the internationally recognized entire territory of Ukraine immediately and unconditionally reverse the decision related to the status of integral parts of Ukraine. Dear colleagues, unfortunately, breaching the international law and undermining international rules-based order has long been a um, making of Russia's aggressive policy towards its neighboring states, aimed at forceful redrawing their borders and trying to curb their sovereign choices. My country, Georgia, is no exception here. We have been long experiencing a pain of aggression and occupation by the Russian Federation, which remains in violation of all the international commitments, including inter alia the EU-mediated 12th August 2008 ceasefire agreement. Russia continues its illegal and provocative actions on the ground, humanitarian and human rights consequences of which are appealing. Accordingly, we will be retabling re a draft resolution on cooperation with Georgia during the current session of the Council, and we count on your continued support. Mr. President, in conclusion, let me reiterate our strong solidarity with our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. The courage of the Ukrainian nation in this fight for peace, prosperity, and freedom will always remain exemplary for all of us and future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. And now I give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Hissein Brahim Taha, Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. You have the floor. Monsieur le Président, Madame le Haut Commissaire, Mesdames et Messieurs les Chefs de Délégation, Mesdames et Messieurs, la promotion de la protection des droits de l'homme pour tous, sans discrimination aucune, constitue le baromètre des références démocratiques et pluralistes d'une société. Je suis donc très heureux de m'adresser à ce Conseil qui promet et protège les droits de l'homme comme l'un des trois piliers des Nations Unies. Alors que les Nations Unies offrent un espace commun à toutes les nations, grandes et petites, pour œuvrer ensemble, au bien commun de l'humanité, dans un climat de paix et de sécurité, cet organe sert de guide et de boussole de morale. Mesdames et Messieurs, les progrès technologiques nous rendent chaque jour plus interdépendants d'une manière que nous n'aurions jamais imaginée. Cette indépendance suggère que nous avons non seulement un avenir commun, mais aussi un présent commun. En conséquence, nous devons poursuivre des politiques communes, des politiques universelles, de par leur nature, durable, de par leur caractère, à mettre en œuvre de manière non discriminatoire à tous les niveaux. Pour y parvenir, nous devons dépasser nos intérêts étroits et œuvrer ensemble pour des politiques qui renforce la paix, la sécurité, le développement et les droits de l'homme à tous les niveaux. Ainsi, nous créerons un modèle meilleur où nous pourrons vivre en paix et en harmonie et le partager fièrement avec les générations futures. Ce Conseil doit prendre les devants sur ce sujet. Je vous assure que le CI sera un partenaire actif dans ce processus. Mesdames et Messieurs, la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme, DUDH, est un document qui a changé le cours de l'histoire récente en engageant les États à respecter les valeurs et les politiques des droits de l'homme qui ont apporté des avantages considérables à des millions de personnes dans le monde. Nous devons continuer à avancer dans cette direction et nous engager collectivement à mettre pleinement en œuvre la DUDH et les traités ultérieurs qui en découlent. Dans le même objectif, la Commission des droits de l'homme de l'OCI 
a également révisé en harmonie la déclaration du Caire de l'OCI sur le droit de l'homme et la convention de l'OCI sur le droit de l'enfant avec les normes universelles de droit de l'homme. La, CPD, la CPDIH continue également à conseiller les États membres sur toutes les questions relatives aux droits de l'homme de manière indépendante et objective. Excellence, l'OCI n'a cessé de faire part de ses graves préoccupations concernant la montée de l'islamophobie. Associée à l'augmentation des discours populistes d'extrême droite et des discours de haine, cette manifestation contemporaine du racisme a pris une dimension mondiale et affecte violemment la vie des millions de musulmans dans différentes parties du monde. Avec le temps, de plus en plus de pays se rendent compte que l'impact négatif des discours de haine en, en ligne et hors ligne est l'un des fléaux de l'humanité. La résolution 16-18 du Conseil des droits de l'homme fournit cette recette complète pour traiter de l'incitation à la haine, à la discrimination et à la violence fondée sur la religion. Nous nous félicitons de la tenue de la huitième réunion du processus d'Istanbul qui a permis d'examiner et de réaffirmer l'engagement des États membres à mettre pleinement en œuvre la résolution 16-18. Un engagement politique fort, couplé à des mécanismes nationaux, en étroite collaboration avec les médias, les institutions religieuses et la société civile, peut garantir à peine à pleine mise en œuvre. Il peut garantir sa pleine mise en œuvre. Mesdames et Messieurs, la communauté persécutée des musulmans Rohingyas continue de souffrir sans que personne ne lève les doigts. La condamnation universelle et les effusions de sang n'ont pas cessé, n'ont pas poussé le gouvernement du Myanmar à prendre des mesures collectives. L'OCI a pris l'initiative de porter l'affaire devant la Cour internationale de justice, CIG, pour empêcher leur génocide, pour empêcher leur génocide de leur extermination. Accédant à la requête de l'OCI, la CIG a émis à l'unanimité des mesures provisoires contraignantes, obligeant le Myanmar à prendre toutes les mesures en son pouvoir pour empêcher les forces militaires hautes de commettre ou d'inciter au génocide contre les musulmans rohingyas. Les efforts universels et transrégionaux sont nécessaires pour faire aboutir ce processus de reddition de comptes et pour apporter l'aide humanitaire nécessaire aux millions de réfugiés rohingyas. Nous ne devons pas échouer dans cette entreprise. Monsieur le Président, le droit à l'autodétermination est le principal cardinal du droit international, dont le déni entraîne la violation de tous les autres droits. Malheureusement, ce droit continue d'être refusé au peuple palestinien et cachemine, ce qui a affecté le règlement pacifique et juste de ces différents au cours de cette dernière décennie et a conduit à de graves violations de leurs droits de l'homme. L'OCI reste gravement préoccupé par les violations continues des droits de l'homme par Israël à travers ses politiques illégales et justes d'apartheid, d'annexion, d'expansion des colonies et de nettoyage ethnique du peuple palestinien dans la Palestine occupée. L'OCI réaffirme que la paix et la nécessité au Moyen-Orient et la sécurité au Moyen-Orient ne peuvent se réaliser qu'avec la fin de l'occupation israélienne du territoire palestinien occupé depuis 1967. Ce Conseil doit continuer à soutenir la juste cause de la Palestine et appuyer tous les efforts permettant aux Palestiniens d'obtenir leurs droits inaléliables, y compris les droits à l'autodétermination. Malgré les efforts coercitifs et les violations des droits de l'homme, les Cachemiris restent déterminés 
à obtenir leur droit légitime à l'autodétermination. Deux rapports du HCDH sur le sujet ont confirmé les préoccupations répétées de l'OCI concernant les violations continues des droits de l'homme. L'OCI approuve les recommandations de ces rapports en faveur d'une émission internationale d'enquête et demande à, au HCDH de poursuivre ses efforts dans ses rapports sur le sujet. Nous appelons également à une résolution pacifique du conflit au Cachemire conformément aux résolutions pertinentes du Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies et aussi aux souhaits du peuple cachemire. La situation des droits de l'homme en République centrafricaine, RCA, reste une source de préoccupation. L'OCI coopère activement avec ses partenaires internationaux, y compris le gouvernement de la RCA, pour instaurer la paix et la stabilité dans le pays par le biais de diverses initiatives, notamment en fournissant une assistance humanitaire. La communauté internationale, en particulier les Nations Unies, est invitée à prendre des mesures concrètes pour permettre au pays et à la région de retrouver la paix, la sécurité et la stabilité. Le Conseil des ministres des Affaires étrangères de l'OCI sur l'Afghanistan, qui s'est tenu récemment, a réaffirmé que le développement, la paix et les droits de l'homme sont liés. L'OCI est donc engagé avec les autorités afghanes sur toutes ces questions. La communauté internationale doit également jouer son rôle en fournissant au peuple afghan sans condition l'aide humanitaire dont il a tant besoin. Ce Conseil doit accorder, aux attentions, une, accorder une attention particulière aux droits civils, politiques, économiques, sociaux et culturels, y compris le droit au développement. Il y aurait un ensemble de droits plutôt que l'autre ne fait qu'affaiblir leur progression. L'agenda 2030 ouvre de manière exhaustive ces droits. Le commerce équitable, la durabilité de la dette, l'accès aux technologies et le renforcement des capacités sont essentiels à la mise en œuvre effective. Le changement climatique est le problème majeur de notre époque. Il est réel et affecte tous les droits de l'homme. L'absence de leadership et de réponses multilatérales décisives pour réaliser les engagements de l'accord de Paris ne fait qu'augmenter ne fait qu'aggraver la situation. Nous devons nous unir tous pour y faire face afin d'offrir à nos générations futures la responsabilité, la possibilité de vivre dans la paix, la prospérité et la sécurité. Excellence, les pays de l'OCI souscrivent pleinement aux idéaux de la déclaration du programme d'action du Beijing concernant l'autodétermination des femmes et des filles. L'OCI dispose également d'un plan d'action élaboré pour la promotion des femmes afin de garantir que les femmes soient représentées de manière appropriée dans tous les processus politiques ainsi que dans les plans socio-économiques et de développement. L'Organisation pour le développement de la femme de l'OCI, récemment créée au Caire, ne ménage aucun effort pour renforcer l'autonomisation des femmes dans tous les domaines. La famille est l'unité fondamentale de la société. Elle doit être protégée et préservée par l'État et la société. L'OCI soutient pleinement la résolution du Conseil des droits de l'homme sur la protection de la famille et condamne toutes les initiatives visant à redéfinir l'institution du mariage et le concept sur la base de la notion d'orientation sexuelle qui s'avère juridiquement, moralement et socialement erronée. Mesdames et Messieurs, cette année marquera le 75e anniversaire de l'ONU. Un moment important pour renouveler notre engagement à défendre le respect, la dignité et l'égalité de droit de tous les êtres humains. Réaffirmons notre détermination à défendre les droits de l'homme universel, quelles que soient les difficultés, afin de construire un avenir commun et juste pour l'amitié, pour l'humanité. Je vous remercie.
Merci, Su Excelencia. Um, y ahora le doy la palabra a la, Su Excelencia, la señora Gillian Triggs, Assistant High Commissioner for Protection of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Sorry, for refugees. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to address the Human Rights Council on the 10th anniversary of the Voluntary Trust Fund, a fund created to ensure the inclusion of least developed countries and small island developing states in human rights protection. Today's theme is the mainstreaming of human rights throughout the United Nations system. For human rights apply to all individuals without discrimination. Um, As if Assistant we can, if High we can Commissioner for Protection the video, with the please. UN Refugee Agency, Secretary. I welcome the opportunity to highlight the specific no. protection needs yeah. of asylum seekers and refugees okay. and of all those forcibly displaced in their own country or who are stateless. People who've been forcibly displaced, today about 84 million people, 50% of them children, are highly vulnerable to persecution, discrimination, abuse and violence. They're in desperate need of the protection that international, regional and national human rights laws and mechanisms can and do offer. Can the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, the reason for stopping is that it's a, it's a video that is planned for tomorrow's panel discussion, not for the high level segment on the mainstreaming. mainstreaming refugees. So it, just a minute, please. I need to clarify what's going on. Thank you. Okay, so the, the um, refugees, we will move it for tomorrow's panel. And we, oh, yesterday, okay. Uh, and we go for UN Habitat, please. Maimuna Mot Sharif. I hope she was there, but it was this one, right? So that okay. was. I hope she got her Mr. President mm -hmm. of the Council, Secretary General, High Commissioner, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. The mandate of UN Habitat to help member states achieve sustainable urban development for all is fundamentally grounded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This has been reflected in the deliberations of the Human Rights Council on a variety of human settlements related issues. It is within this framework of a human rights based approach to development that I reiterate that the Secretary General's call for an immediate cessation of hostilities and the return to normalcy in territory of Ukraine. Civilians always pay the highest price. This is why the United Nations is scaling up our humanitarian operations in and around Ukraine. To the mayors and community leaders on the front line, my admirations for your courage and leadership during this difficult time. At UN Habitat, we work to provide policy advice and technical assistance 
to help member states progressively advance towards the universal achievement of rights associated with an adequate standard of living and access to adequate land, housing, water and sanitation, safety and a healthy urban environment are basic pillars of UN Habitat's program of work. Following a human rights-based approach, we prioritize the needs of the poorest and those facing the greatest vulnerability at global, regional and local levels. This includes the needs of those displaced by conflict or natural disaster. As Executive Director of UN Habitat, I have prioritized housing, climate change and the local of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda with the human rights approach as the foundation of all that we do. Member states are currently facing a complex and severe housing crisis. It is estimated that the global shortage of adequate housing may exceed 440 million units by 2025. That means more than 1 billion people are without a human right to health, security and well-being. In some member states, this crisis is driven by the tax or market frameworks for housing. In others, poverty, poorly planned development and a lack of public investment may be the dominant factors. The cause of climate change, particularly those of adaptation, fall heavily on the urban poor. Their homes are often in the most environmentally precarious sites and their water and sanitation systems are the most fragile. Whether it is housing, the provision of basic services or wider questions of a healthy environment for communities, responsibility often fall to local governments. National governments will set the policy agenda and assign responsibilities. As a former mayor, I know that it is essential to harness the experience and skills of local governments and ensure that they have proportionate resource to their obligations. We must localize the sustainable development goals. Across of all these issues and contexts, the rights-based approach championed by the Secretary-General in his call to action and in our common agenda is an effective framework. Considering how national and sub-national governments can respect, protect and fulfill the rights of their citizens and effectively engage them in this process produces better policy with more sustainable outcomes. UN Habitat's partnership within and beyond the UN family reflect this. We have worked closely with the World Health Organization for many years on policy advice and technical assistance to improve human health in the urban environment. This partnership now includes looking forward to a post-COVID world and considering the ways in which the pandemic has reminded us of the value of good planning and of an adequate home. We welcome the convening of advisory groups on urban development by the Presidents of the General Assembly and the Secretary General and the UN Economic Commission's convening of a forum of mayors. These have the potential for establishing a regular dialogue between sub-national governments and multilateral forums that will help deliver our sustainable development ambitions at the local level. This is fundamentally a dialogue about how to deliver human rights all the way to people's doorsteps. I wish the Human Rights Council the best in its coming deliberations where you touch upon issues of human rights in cities and the variety of rights related to achieving an adequate standard of living in human settlements, please count on our support. 
led by our recently established Geneva office and with the support of our global network, we will follow and contribute where appropriate. We will also seek to support the efforts of the High Commissioner and Member States to consolidate and advance the universal periodic review process. We are ready to provide technical assistance to support delivery of agreed recommendations. We also look forward to facilitating the engagement of sub-national governments to ensure effective implementation at the local level. I look forward to working with all of you to achieve a better urban future. Let me end by inviting all of you to the 11 sessions of the World Urban Forum which will take place in Katowice, Poland from 26 to 30th June 2022. Thank you. Thank you. And the last um, speaker is uh, His Excellency Mr. Ip Peterson, Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund. You have the floor. Excellencies, distinguished guests, protecting human rights for all people is a precondition for individual well-being and for sustainable development. Sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights are aligned to the enjoyment of many other human rights, including the right to life, health, education, equality and non-discrimination, privacy and individual autonomy. UNFPA works to empower individuals and communities to claim their sexual and reproductive health and rights and advance gender equality to achieve the vision of the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development Programme of Action and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic threatens to undo years of progress in advancing women's health and rights. We have seen sexual and reproductive health services disrupted and human rights under in increasing pressure around the world. Now, more than ever, we must stand with women and girls and stand up for their human rights. This year, the High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable De uh, Development will deliberate on building back better from COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda. UNFPA urges all stakeholders to renew their commitment and take strategic action to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights and gender equality. It's of critical importance to the broader sustainable development agenda. And for UNFPA's part, as reflected in our recently adopted strategic plan for 2022 to 25, we will continue to push forward for women's and girls' rights and choices. Our efforts focus on achieving three transformative results by 2030. Zero unmet need for family planning, zero preventable maternal death, and zero gender-based violence and harmful practices, including female genital mutilation and child marriage. The promotion and protection of human rights, particularly the rights of women, girls, young people, and those population groups whose sexual and reproductive health and rights are most at risk, will help us accelerate progress and reach those furthest behind. For UNFPA, standing up for human rights in particular means three actions. Helping address inequality and discrimination, supporting governments to provide quality services aligned with international human rights norms and standards, and strengthening accountability systems to bring to light systemic and structural shortcomings that underlie human rights violations. Together with our UN partners and civil society organizations, UNFPA supports intergovernmental processes for the development of international human rights standards, as well as count accountability frameworks for monitoring the implementation of recommendations on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Yet, norm setting needs to be translated into effective implementation on the ground. And to promote this, UNFPA stresses the importance of continued engagement with international human rights mechanisms, such as the UN, UN treaty bodies, special procedures of the Human Rights Council, and the Universal Periodic Review. We welcome the initiative 
taken by a number of member states in using language from their commitments made at the Nairobi summit on ICPD 25 to ensure that the implementation of human rights recommendations and related ICD, ICPD commitments go hand in hand. At UNFPA, we want to walk the talk, and we know that only that which can be measured matters. So our new strategic plan therefore includes an indicator to access the follow-up and implementation of recommendations of international and regional human rights mechanisms related to discriminatory social and gender norms and practices on sexual and reproductive health, gender-based gender violence and harmful practices. And to this end, we will strengthen our collaboration with government entities coordinating the implementation of human rights recommendations. And we will support the monitoring role of national human rights institutions and all other, other stakeholders. Human rights laws apply in all circumstances. So building accountability to women across and girls across the humanitarian development and peace nexus is a priority for UNFPA. We are on the ground before, during and after the crisis. We work closely with governments, local NGOs, UN and other partners to ensure that sexual and reproductive health and rights and the prevention and protection from gender-based violence are integrated into emergency responses. We need to work together across the humanitarian development and the human rights pillars to ensure a unified response to the needs of vulnerable populations. It's encouraging to see the, the increasing attention the Human Rights Council is dedicating to these issues. This is essential if we are to achieve our goals to end unmet needs for family planning, end preventable maternal deaths, and end gender-based violence and harmful practices by 2030. So in closing, let me reaffirm UNFPA will continue to work together with all of you to meet our obligations and commitments to realizing sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights for all. I thank you. Thank you. Este fue el último orador de la lista. Nos volveremos a reunir esta tarde a las tres eh, para continuar con el segmento de alto nivel. Ya finalizando, con esto doy por concluida la sexta reunión del 49 noveno periodo de sesiones del Consejo de Derechos Humanos.